Thank you. Good morning. This is a convening of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission public meeting. And because we're holding this virtually, I'll take a roll call. Good morning, Commissioner O'Brien. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner Hill. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Commissioner Skinner. Good morning. And good morning, Commissioner Maynard. Good morning, I'm here. Excellent. Before we get started um, on our agenda, I, I do want to just um, note that I have filed a 23B3 disclosure, which is a disclosure of parents' conflict of interest with my appointing official, just indicating that um, I have learned that um, former chairwoman of the Nevada Gaming Control Board is now a, um, uh, a, a non-executive director of um, board of directors at the point that uh, I was lucky enough to have her good guidance and counsel when we were both regulators. And then she shifted to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where she is a fellow and have also had the benefit of her guidance over the last few years. So um, I wanted to point out that relationship. And then also Teresa Fiore, I understand is now a man manager of responsible gaming and corporate social responsibility at points that. And she, of course, is a former member of our of our, um, MGC's uh, research and uh, responsible gaming um, division here. And we were lucky to have the benefit of, of Teresa's service for several years. She was here in advance of my arrival in 2019. She happens to also have been a high school friend of my second, now very much adult son. So that disclosure has been filed, as I said, with the appointing officials and has been circulated to you commissioners in um, accordance with our own internal um, code of ethics. Any questions on that, commissioners? Not as to yours, Madam Chair, but I didn't find out that Teresa Fiore was employed by PointsBet until um, late yesterday. So I haven't filed anything with my appointing authority. I had no direct contact with Ms. Fiore while she was here um, in terms of supervision or anything like that, but I haven't filed anything because I was not made aware of it until yesterday. So um, I believe I can be fair and impartial, but I don't, I have not filed a 23B3. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. I happened because of, I think LinkedIn, I knew that Michelle O'Brien, that's all. <clears throat> yep. All right. So uh, thank you everybody. And good morning to our applicant. Uh, today we are um, meeting with our final of six applicants for untethered category three online sports wagering license. Um, there are, I suppose, benefits to being um, this applicant or we just must thank you for your ongoing patience. Uh, we uh, we uh, look forward to hearing from Massachusetts LLC. Uh, after today, we will begin um, our, our our uh, overall determination of the of the applicants as a whole, and that will begin starting late tomorrow afternoon into the next day, and ending on likely ending on Friday. So thank you. And so now I'm going to turn to item four A, the presentation and of the application and the demonstration of the technology. Good morning to points back. Thank you and good morning, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Commissioner Skinner, Commissioner Hill, Commissioner O'Brien, and Commissioner Maynard. My name is Andrew Moreno. I am the Senior Director of Regulatory Operations here at PointsBet. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you in connection with PointsBet's application for a Category 3 Sports Wagering Operator License. We are very excited to have this opportunity to speak with the Commission and the prospect of bringing our product to the Commonwealth. Now, there are some portions of our application that we, be, we believe are commercially sensitive or proprietary as provided by Chapter 23. So while we won't be addressing them in our prepared remarks here, if there are any questions that touch upon these areas, we will then ask that they be discussed in an executive session. Uh, we have uh, six people with us on the line today who will be presenting. Uh, first and foremost, our U.S. CEO, Johnny Aiken, our head of U.S. legal and compliance, Rachel Casper, our Executive Vice President of Media and Strategy, Rick Martira, our Senior Director of Diversity, Culture, and Employee Experience, Laura Leffler, our Manager of Trading Compliance, Andrew Menino, 
And lastly, Lauren Crow, our Director of Engineering Operations that will perform a walkthrough of our platform. We will begin by introducing our Chief Executive Officer, Johnny Aiken, who will now provide opening remarks for our presentation and demonstration. With that, I turn it over to you, Johnny. Thanks, Andrew, and, and thanks again for the opportunity to uh, present today, uh, you know, the points about business. Um, I'll start by kicking off with the experience that's held within the company, if we could kindly go to the next slide. Um, PointsBet is a global platform that is successfully operating in only highly sort of regulated markets across Australia, Canada in Ontario, and now 14 jurisdictions in the United States. Our, our managing director and group CEO is a gentleman called Sam Swinnell. Sam has considerable experience across many decades now in online sports betting. Firstly, we tote uh, uh, Tasmania in Australia before he uh, was appointed to run TomWaterhouse.com, one of the most successful online .com sports betting businesses in Australia through the 2010s. That business was acquired by Gal William Hill in, in the middle of the 2010s. And then Sam um, worked with the founders of PointsBet to create PointsBet in, in Australia. Um, Sam has both an amazing understanding of running sort of sort of digital businesses paired with strong corporate governance. Um, myself, as, as Andrew kindly sort of introduced me, I'm Johnny Aiken, the US CEO. I've been based here in the US since the middle of 2018 with my family, uh, originally based in New Jersey, uh, which was the first market we went live in, in in January of 2019. I'm now based with the team here in Denver, Colorado, which is our corporate headquarters in the US and houses around 200 full-time employees. My experience is a little bit the same as Sam's. I've, I've grown up in the industry. It's all I've ever wanted to do. Uh, I've worked on the sort of regulator side with Greyhound Racing Australia through the early 2000s. I then worked at TomWaterhouse.com, helping Sam and Tom uh, to, to grow and run that company. I then worked as the trading and operations director at William Hill Australia, reporting into the CEO and managing over 200 um, people in different trading operations and content functions um, and joined PointsBet um, at the start of 2018, firstly as the company's group COO and then as its CEO of the USA uh, upon completion of our fir first uh, market access deal in New Jersey with uh, the uh, Netherlands. Um, and last but not least, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge Brett Patton, who's our non-executive Chairman, uh, Brett has considerable um, experience in the equities markets in Australia um, in his time with both sort of UBS and Citigroup. Uh, he also served as a non-executive director at Tabcorp and also as chair of audit and risk uh, for the demerged entity called Echo Entertainment. Brett has significant experience at a financial and gaming level um, and again, um, is a well sort of regarded chairman and, and sort of member of our board. Um, if we could kindly go to the next slide, that'd be great. Although the company, I guess, still is sort of sort of relatively new stage, having, um, you know, uh, taken its first bet in Australia in um, the year of 2017 and then launched in the US at the start of January 2019. Um, it's certainly a business that is run by very experienced people that have walked the journey, not only in the Australian um, sort of regulated online sports betting market, but also the European online sports betting market. Um, you know, we've been live now in the US for four years. Uh, we took our first bed in January of 2019 in New Jersey, um, and we've now been able to scale the business and launch successfully in 13 other uh, jurisdictions of the US, along with Ontario and Canada. So we're, we're operating 15 uh, jurisdictions in North America combined. Um, you know, we've done that through really leaning on excellence in sports betting. That's, that's the DNA of the company. That's why the business was created to really offer an unparalleled sports betting experience, be it for the $5 better, the $50 better, or the, the $1,000 better, give them an experience across pregame and live betting um, that they can't get anywhere else. And, and by owning our own technology, we really have the, I guess, the keys, of our sort of destiny in our hand to really deliver upon that excellent sports betting experience. And, you know, we've been acknowledged by third parties such as Islas and Crychick as having a top three app and we'll continue to invest in that app to make it known that, you know, PointsBet has sports betting excellence, which for us drives awareness, signups and people to stay loyal and, and play with PointsBet. Um, one of the pillars of, of starting the business and our success was, was controlling our, our technology. That is a learning from 
myself, Sam, and, and and the founders' experience with other companies where they weren't controlling their their technology. From day one of the company starting in Australia, uh, you know, we owned owned our source code. It's modern source code that we can uh, develop sort of rapidly and nimbly to solve problems for customers, create value for customers, and also um, to scale the business across uh, the US. It sort of sort of every jurisdiction's built different. It, every jurisdiction has its sort of nuances uh, when it comes to rules and regulations. And we've been able to adapt very quickly and in line with those sort of regulations because we're controlling the, the uh, technology. And then last but not least, you know, the team that runs PointsBet. As I said, we have deep experience um, from our journey in Australia, which is a heavily sort of regulated market. We've also combined that with extreme experience from the European market to our gentlemen that are not on the call today that are executives of the business in the US. The first, Mark Hughes is our chief chief product officer, formerly the founder and CEO of Bannock Technology and formerly the head of quantitative analytics for the Flutter Group in, in Europe. And Angus Mulverhill, who's our chief revenue officer here in the USA, was formerly the head of international strategy uh, for Betfair uh, within the Flutter Group. So. And then we pair that with the great experience we have on the phone today with, uh, you know, the American group um, that are excellent at what they do in compliance, legal, marketing, um, trading compliance as such. So we really feel we pair our ambition with an amazing platform that's pointed at sports betting excellence and a, an amazing team that can flex, you know, the opportunity through that technology. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it on uh, to the next presenter, Rick Matera, our executive vice president. Vice President of Media and Strategy. Excellent. Thank you, Johnny. Appreciate the intro. And thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, for the opportunity to discuss points bet today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Rick Martira. I am the Executive Vice President of Media and Strategy here at Points Bet. Uh, and I'll be saying a few words on our marketing overview uh, from my office here uh, in between my Celtics memorabilia as a fellow uh, New Englander from the area here. So uh, our marketing approach here, uh, building on what Johnny just mentioned, premium product. We believe in a product-led strategy first and foremost. We want to bring that innovative product to the sports betters of Massachusetts with a focus on uh, features and functionality that they can't get anywhere else. We feel like if we leave with that product, everything else kind of falls into line. And the way that we want to deliver that premium product messaging is through a very localized media approach. We don't really believe in a one-size-fits-all national advertising or national media approach. We tailor each campaign specific to the jurisdiction that we're going into, which we'll touch on a little bit later as well. At the wider range would be that localized media plan, but then even that much more uh, focused would be a dedicated VIP team specific to that jurisdiction on the ground, helping to cater to those high-staking prospects and customers. And then all of that is underpinned by targeted promotions um, that are kind of uh, using the foundation of our customer segmentation and CRM funnels to make sure that everyone's having a positive customer journey here throughout their marketing life cycle. Next slide. The way that we look at uh, new states, is kind of a three-phased approach. There's pre-launch, launch, and post-launch. So the first of those phases would be pre-launch. We're looking for primarily to get some lead generation for people to raise their hands so that they can uh, learn about points bet, learn about when we're launching in the state, and also get to know our brand a little bit, maybe for the first time, because we do have such a localized approach in other markets, they might not have seen our brand as much. So that comes in the form of some tactics you might hear see on the right-hand side here, very targeted social video or lead generation ads or, or dedicated emails specific to that state, and engaging content that's produced by our internal, very much uh, growing content studio and team. Uh, where we're putting out uh, multimedia content uh, pieces in the forms of newsletter, shows, social videos, all helping to inform betters uh, and give them both fun and informative information. Next slide. Then at launch, we'd certainly be dialing up our brand a little bit more. So we might see tactics like you see in the gray boxes here. First and foremost, um, some digital assets that allow us to really get in on the, the targeting uh, specific to the Massachusetts sports betters. But that second box is a real uh, great opportunity for us. Through our uh, partnership with NBC Sports, where we are an official sports betting partner of NBC, 
Uh, it's real one we're really excited about because they have such a deep portfolio in the state of Massachusetts. That comes in the form of NBC Sports Boston, uh, NBC 10, even the local Telemundo station are all opportunities for us uh, through that partnership to both advertise and integrate into uh, at a localized fashion. We complement a lot of that broadcast with uh, extended video targeted reach through OTT and CTV channels. And then you'll also see some media as part of our league partnerships, uh, being an official partner with the NBA, NHL, and PGA Tour, you'll see points bet media on those owned and operated properties as well, all targeted to the specific state. Next slide. Um, those would be the tactics. Here's what, an example of what you might see from our brand. Um, this collage to the right um, showcases some of our imagery, some of our messaging. I think what you'll notice as a, a theme here is that product coming through. We like to show the product. We like to showcase those unique features, things like lightning bets or live streaming capabilities or partial cash out. Um, and in the bottom right, you can see an example of one of our latest shows from our content studio, Stoppage Time, all around soccer betting. Next slide. And then post-launch, uh, the focus would shift as you can imagine. So while we're continuously doing customer acquisition, um, Post-launch, a lot of our focus also goes to retention and loyalty, and that's bringing customers messaging, offers, uh, making sure that they're aware of all of the opportunities that PointsBet is providing to them, be it our parlay boost functionality where you can build a parlay and boost the parlay of your choosing uh, each day, or, or our power hour offer where each day we are releasing a new promotion all around the sporting calendar specifically designed for that local market. Next slide. And lastly, regardless of if we're talking about pre-launch, launch, launch uh, or post-launch, everything is done through the lens of our responsible gaming policies. Um, I know uh, Rachel is actually gonna dive deeper into this actually in our next section, but from a marketing perspective, those same three pillars of our responsible gaming policies uh, permeate into everything that we do. We work extremely closely with our compliance, legal uh, and responsible gaming manager on everything out the door. We provide patrons uh, with uh, vast opportunities to either block our promotional message, unsubscribe for us, um, or self-exclude. And we're always evaluating these, pro these uh, policies, including in Q3 of 2022, we actually removed the term risk-free from all of our advertising and promotions as one recent example here. So appreciate that, hopefully informative. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Rachel here. Thank you very much, Rick. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners. Um, it's my pleasure to present to you today on behalf of PointsBet. My name is Rachel Casper. I'm the Vice President of Legal Compliance and Licensing here in the US. Um, if you can advance to the next slide. As is with most operators, one of the uh, strategic uh, foundations here at PointsBet is making sure that responsible gaming um, is at the forefront. That helps us be good corporate citizens. It allows us to demonstrate awareness of the harms that are out there. Um, and as such, it, in turn, it allows us to focus on prevention and mitigation resources. As mentioned, we have a dedicated responsible gaming team, which we're really proud of. Um, our manager who leads that team is well, well respected among her peers and stakeholders and is well first um, in the regulatory landscape inclusive of the Commonwealth. Our responsible gaming team does work very closely um, with all of our departments and the purpose there really is to ensure that each unique business uh, function is optimized to support responsible gaming in their everyday efforts. We also recognize at PointsBet that there's a continuum of users, um, not just on our platform, but all platforms in general, from those that truly utilize it for recreation purposes, and then those who may exhibit um, signs of addiction or problem gambling. And with that, I'd like to dive into sort of the three guideposts that we have here at PointsBet for our responsible gaming strategy um, that really support and promote positive play. The first is that we want to ensure that every customer is utilizing the, the app or website here at PointsBet for entertainment purposes only. Um, 
sort of to support that, it's really uh, important that the messaging and the touch points that we put out to the customer through that user journey are ones in which uh, they aim to prevent those related gambling related harms and then normalize that, that healthy play on the day to day. Um, and then that sort of final step or guidepost that we have here is the identification and intervention of a player who may be demonstrating a uh, lack of control and then making sure that they have their correct tools and sort of support resources communicated to them um, so they can find that help uh, as necessary. Next slide. We thought the sort of best way to maybe uh, emphasize the different guideposts that we have within this responsible gaming strategy would be to put uh, you in the shoes of a user and how they would walk through this process from the time of sign up all the way through acquisition and then utilization of the app. And so that's what we've done here today. What you're seeing on this first screen is uh, sort of what we would call the know your customer and the requirements that uh, every regulator has around different messaging and acknowledgements, uh, you know, customer protection, and then responsible gaming messaging that needs to be at the forefront when an individual chooses to sign up. So you will see through these different slides or pictures, um, all of that required information would be present. Again, these are sort of screenshots of already live uh, environments. So obviously you're seeing Ohio there, this would be something that would be completely tailored to um, any jurisdiction we go into, including the Commonwealth, um, and to highlight sort of and reiterate what our CEO, Mr. Eakin, said, uh, we have that ability to quickly pivot and make those changes as we own our own technology. Um, so you'll see some of those uh, requirements here, the validation of the player, whether it's ID, age, or location. Um, specifically the responsible gaming helpline or any messaging that may be required by a particular jurisdiction. Um, so next slide. So here is sort of a timeline of events from the point that they are sort of uh, are interfacing with that KYC and sort of how we as a team are monitoring the, the accounts, the individuals, the communications to ensure that healthy play um, is, is at the forefront. So we obviously walked through the acquisition portion there. And I think it's important to note that any physical or digital advertising, as Rick had mentioned, will have all of the necessary support messaging from a responsible gaming perspective that's in alignment with every uh, jurisdiction or every jurisdictional requirement. So that's sort of what they'll see as they uh, first interface with the app or the website. Um, within one hour of actually creating that account, they will receive an email that highlights the different tools that we have on platform where they can set different limits in order to game in a healthy and responsible way, as well as additional support resources that may be available to them. We recognize that it's not enough to just put that information in front of them upon account creation. But in order to have a healthy play as the customers retain throughout their life cycle or journey, it's important that we continue to communicate those resources. And so customers will receive a, a monthly RG email. And then the team has also initiated a daily post, um, a responsible gaming post on social media so that uh, again, if they're engaging with us on sort of uh, different platforms, they're seeing that that's at the forefront for us as well as a company. I think it's worth noting that individuals who may have a higher spend um, will be require and do require a different sort of tailored responsible gaming message. And so that's what we've done with our both platinum and diamond status clients. They're getting more of a customized onboarding message. Um, whether it's through a specific text message, email, or directly from an account manager that they may be working with um, to ensure that the play that they're exhibiting is healthy and normal for them. I would be remiss if I didn't point out sort of uh, the fact that all of this is on a, you know, sort of timeline here of how we go through things, but we recognize that individuals have different experiences themselves. And so uh, a key for us is to monitor the behavior of different customers. And we'll, we'll touch on that in a few slides and how we do that. Um, but it's important to highlight throughout each one of these stages that that's something that we monitor as a team 
Um, and we, when we do see those sort of uh, behavioral patterns that we can identify the individual and customize any type of support and communication to them. Next slide. <clears throat> So again, as Rick gave you sort of some examples of different marketing materials that we have in advertising, we thought it would also be helpful um, for the commission to see different responsible gaming messaging that we have um, in different areas. So if we start at the top there, um, that's an example of what an individual may see on a daily social media post, um, really highlighting those different limit setting tools so that they can control um, that behavior and, and really function within what's normal for them. There's also integrations um, across NBC BetCast. So you'll see at the bottom there how it says bet responsibly and gives the appropriate responsible gaming messaging. Um, so it's constantly at the forefront if they're engaging with us in sort of different areas of the app. In the middle, this is an in-app message that's automatically sent to an individual and it's sort of a calculation that we do based on sort of the amount of spend and the age of the individual, this uh, information will be customized to them so that it's uh, effective and meaningful for them. And then finally, we have an externally facing responsible gambling page um, where anybody, account holders or not, can go and receive that information. We know, unfortunately, that gambling addiction doesn't just impact the individual, but families, friends, and society as a whole. So this is a responsible gambling page that is available um, for anyone. Next slide. Again, as Rick sort of touched on, one of the things that we have highlighted as extremely important moving forward in our responsible gaming strategy here at PointsBet is giving um, the, the consumer or the user the opportunity to control how much interaction they're receiving in the way of marketing and advertising. Um, and as Rick mentioned, they can unsubscribe to those marketing and advertising emails. And I think it's worth pausing here for a moment to say that when they unsubscribe, they are not unsubscribing from responsible gaming support messages. They will still receive those. Um, they will not receive the promotional information that would come um, through those normal channels. Um, we, we also, you know, as we've gone through responsible gaming and its growth through the industry, we've noticed that one of the areas that it's important to provide information to patrons around is how they can control ads they may see on social media. And so we have really provided extensive resources on our websites and pointed them to um, the correct resources in the social and digital space where they can get step-by-step -step instructions on how to actually block um, those types of gaming ads on those platforms so that they're reducing the amount of interaction that they're receiving there. Next slide. So we've talked about, um, you know, the sort of KY, KYC process, the acquisition process, um, you know, how they can control the different marketing or advertising. But I think it's also really important to highlight that on every main page throughout the user journey on the website or the app, they constantly have access to a variety of information. Um, here you'll see at the bottom left, they have responsible gaming and player protection pages that they can visit. They have also the responsible gaming helpline, state specific resources that are dictated by regulators and that we provide as such. Um, and additionally, account history there to the right. And, the reason account history is really critical um, for individuals is that they can actually go back and sort of see um, what they're actually spending, but it also categorizes and um, delineates when they actually set certain limits so they can go back and see the point in time when they decided to um, put limits on themselves. Next slide. So in that vein of helping individuals make those informed choices and to really heighten um, you know, sports wagering literacy, we thought it was important to provide a variety of different um, limits that an individual can place on their account. And we have them there over to uh, the one side of the screen. So you can see a deposit limit, a wager limit, a time on site limit, a spend limit and then a cool off or self-exclusion specific to, to points bet. 
I think that, you know, this is important so that people can choose a variety of these. Everyone's different um, and they can choose, you know, maybe three or seven days or if they're in a situation where they need 30 days off platform, they can do that. Um, and the, the time limits cannot be removed after uh, 24 hours after setting them, which I think is important. You know, you don't want that person to make the decision to set that time limit and then all of a sudden maybe be encouraged to bet again. We, we do not allow them to change that for 24 hours. We think that's a best practice. Um, and again, these will be based on the jurisdiction the user's in. Um, and of course, does not apply to other operators, but is specific to points, but and easily configurable, I think, you know, which is really important too for any regulator that the time limits can be adjusted based on any guidance or directive received from a regulator. Next slide. So this is just an example. Um, this is not exactly what it would be, but we thought it might be important to provide um, some visual here to, to the commission of what a potential um, message would be from our responsible gaming team to an individual who chose to um, cool off. And so you'll see that this is obviously the confirmation. It very clearly tells them what state and website they are choosing to cool off from the number of days that they have selected and that they will not be able to access their account during this time. However, it's very important that they obviously have the ability to access and withdraw any funds on that account. And so our customer service team is there to assist them um, in that situation and they are directed to them. It's also really important to point out that our customer service team not only receives the responsible gaming training that every employee receives, but also um, a heightened level of instruction on how to handle individuals who may be experiencing um, some of those signs. Uh, additionally, you'll see the different resources that we have provided here and obviously some state specific resources. And again, this cool off is tailored for each jurisdiction. Um, and so here we put in the Massachusetts Problem Gambling Helpline and Game Sense, but again, be, can be tailored um, with any guidance that we may receive uh, from, from the regulator. Next slide. So the account history, we touched on this briefly on the other slide of the different resources that individuals have in order to make those in, informed choices and you know, affect their positive play. This is more of a granular example of if an individual were to click into their account history, um, that sort of line item of when they may set that limit and it tells them how long the limit's for. So we here, can see here that it is for um, one week with an amount of $50. Um, they can actually get their statements online going back 24 months. Um, but if they need any history above and beyond that, they can contact customer service um, to retrieve any history above and beyond 24 months. But we think this is a great way for individuals, again, to actually export that data and take a look at what they've actually spent on platform, the different limits they've set, and how maybe their uh, play has been positively, positively impacted um, by setting those limits. Next slide. So that third cornerstone that we talked about in the responsible gaming strategy for points bet was all about identification and intervention. And there are sort of a few different ways that we approach that here at points, but you'll see that the sort of outer um, squares that we have on this slide are both pointing in towards our responsible gaming team. The, the left-hand side, we have the customer communication or, or ad hoc, and this is really the monitoring of different chat, email, text, social media of, an, of a user, seeing if there's something in their communication pattern that raises a red flag and requires that it be escalated to the responsible gaming team. And this isn't just our CS team. There's a variety of teams that will sort of monitor these things and escalate um, to the RG team to determine the appropriate sort of mode of communication. 
but we don't feel that that's enough. So another thing that we do is we implement a sort of behavioral civic surveillance. And this is not just looking at the communications from the individual or social media posts, but then also looking at the account for red flags. And we've itemized a few things here, such as lifetime losses, session length, deposit size, and then somebody who appears to potentially be chasing losses. Um, and, and so we will monitor that and that will be fed back into the responsible gaming team again to reach out to that individual. I think it's really important to note that one of the things that is on the roadmap for us as a company is the development and deployment of an AI predictive model. And so the idea here is actually to create the technology and implement it so that it would automatically sort of evaluate these different factors and elevate in real time to the responsible gaming team who can then put a you know, human eye towards it and say, is this something um, that needs to be addressed. And so we're really very excited about that, that development and opportunity. We've worked our way through this strategy and sort of those three guideposts that we have that really direct us as a company and our responsible gambling efforts. But I think one of the other things that's very important to our leadership is the engagement that we have with stakeholders across the industry. We recognize that information is always changing, research is always changing, and I think to be on the forefront of that, those partnerships are really critical. And so in 2022, we partnered with NCPG and MACGH in order to issue a survey um, to individuals to try and inform us as far as um, responsible gaming initiatives and things we should be providing generally um, to individuals. I think some key takeaways here was one, we had a variety of people who responded to the survey, um, whether they were treatment professionals or individuals who had previously experienced addiction. Um, and they all had very similar responses, which we thought was very interesting and, and informative. And one of the sort of top recommendations that was endorsed by the group was that sharing of support resources, you know, statewide self-exclusion, uh, limit setting tools. So again, that's why that's become so critical um, to that messaging that an individual will receive here at points, but throughout their user journey. Um, and then uh, finally, obviously, the individuals demonstrated interest in affordability checks, which really are, you know, determining that the individual has the finances in order to be um, having the type of play that they are. Um, and, and of course, that dovetails nicely into the fact that they also felt the most important impact was obviously on an individual personal life um, and, and finances. So these key takeaways have been something that we've uh, held closely to the best here at PointsBet and help guide us as we continue to develop um, our responsible gaming strategy and as it evolves. Next slide. Um, finally, I'd like to just point out that in 2022, PointsBet US and PointsBet Canada both received the Responsible Gaming Check Accreditation from Responsible Gambling uh, Council. And I think this really obviously highlights the uh, commitment that we have to, to healthy play. It also ensures that the messaging that we're sending out to patron is in alignment with the highest standards in the industry. Um, and it also helps us to continue to develop intervention methods that put that user uh, front and center um, while directing them to the rest, the best resources uh, available. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. At this time, I'm going to turn over the presentation to my colleague, uh, Laura Leffler. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners for the opportunity to discuss PointsBet today. My name is Laura Leffler and I am the Senior Director of Diversity, Culture and Employee Experience here at PointsBet. Next slide, yep. I'd like to take a minute to focus on PointsBet's four pillars of diversity, equity and inclusion. These pillars were created to improve PointsBet overall DE&I strategies, but also to improve PointsBet employee value proposition where we recognize that our people are our most important asset and we are committed to achieving diversity and inclusion in our workplace. We will dig deeper into each of these slides or each of these pillars on the next couple of slides, um, but I will draw your attention to them right now. And our first one is 
our workforce, attracting and retaining our people to build a high performance team that is reflective of a diverse company. Our workplace, investing in our people through professional opportunities, learning and development and supporting their career goals. Supplier diversity, where we have intentional partnerships with underrepresented groups, where we promote the growth of our communities that we work and serve. And our last pillar, the marketplace, where our external stakeholder connections to our customers and business partners embrace the differences of our audience groups. PointsBet is committed to a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace for all to succeed. We do recognize that when we perform better as a whole, we perform better as a whole when our workplace is diverse. We want all of our employees to feel seen, heard, and a chance at success. With that being said, our workforce is made up of 23% women, 39% of our workforce is diverse, and when we look deeper, we will find that 26% of women are in leadership, and 14% make up our diverse leaders. As we grow in this space, our talent acquisition team uses various sourcing methods to recruit diverse candidates for all open roles. LinkedIn, where we can spread the word about our opportunities across diverse pools of talent, built in a top tech source for diverse candidates, and women in sports technology, with a focus of driving growth opportunities for women, and this is inclusive of PointsBet hosting a fellow this past year. Additionally, PointsBet has established an external and internal DEI committee. Our external committee consists of three members who are respected individuals in the sports world, along with being notable diversity advocates of their communities. Our intentions are to utilize our external members as strategic council councilmen. Our internal committee is a group of 10 employees across all teams charged with serving as internal planning and ambassador for the group's DEI efforts. Having this committee helps us have a real time pulse on our employees' needs and wants as we grow in this space. Finally, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that Points Bet was just recently awarded Colorado's best places to work, Colorado's best mid sized places to work, and New York City's best places to work. This is an achievement that we are honored to have been given. These awards recognize companies who offer the best total rewards programs, compensation packages, DEI efforts, and a people first cultural offering amongst their peers. Next slide. In 2022, PointsBet had a strong focus to invest in underrepresented groups within the sports industry. I can say that we are proud to have given over 725,000 in financial contributions towards these groups. Our most notable contributions were 500,000 to Hampton and Norfolk in support of scholarship funds, 150,000 to Fort ATX Foundation for the creation of safe spaces for families to connect and be active in their communities, 10,000 to the Nota Begay Foundation in support of advancing cultures of American Native American community health, and lastly, 50,000 to women in sports technology in support of women career advancement. We do recognize that our contributions can help break down barriers and foster inclusion within their communities. We know that when everyone feels welcomed and supported, everyone can benefit. When these groups are supported, they can reach their full potential and, their, and they contribute their unique talents and perspectives. At PointsBet, we do look forward to continuing to support underrepresented groups. Just as it is important for us to support underrepresented groups, it's equally as important to us that we commit to increase diverse vendor spend on an annual basis. We've spent nearly 1.9 million on minority owned, women owned and veteran owned business enterprises in 2022. In order to commit to diverse vendor spend, we will award diverse vendor contracts where feasible, select diverse vendors, even if they are not the lowest bidder. Where possible, we will replace expiring contracts with diverse vendors. And lastly, we will partner with supplier diversity programs. By supporting diverse vendors, we can aid in the economic recovery and sustainability of their communities. Diversification is about engaging additional supply partners, such as um, a local call center that is there in Massachusetts, 
um, where we've had preliminary talks of a partnership. This call center is a women-owned business in which we would be honored to partner with should the opportunity present itself. In closing out today's session of DE&I, at PointsBet, we recognize the importance of this role and the work that's cut out for it. In addition to the promotion of a diverse and inclusive workplace, we are focused on attracting and retaining diverse talent, increasing our diversity percentage year over year, creating employee resource groups, introducing learning and development to our workforce, and partnerships with diverse vendors, such as the call center that I mentioned. Thank you for your time today, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. I welcome answering any questions you may have in the Q&A section. I will pass our presentation on over to Andrew. Uh, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Andrew Menino. I am Trading Compliance Manager here at PointsBet and I'll be saying a few words about sports analytics. So first of all, our in-house technology and trading system. Uh, we use Odds Factory, which is our own in-house system uh, that aggregates and displays odds on site, both pre-match and in play. And because we own all our own technology, that means we can quickly respond uh, to client or trading team requests and adjust odds or market offering on the fly. Uh, we do have a global trading team, which means we have direct coverage uh, from our people of what's on site at all times, 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. Uh, we have trading offices based in New York, Denver, Melbourne, and Dublin, which means there's always someone operating on local time who's monitoring the system. Our trading compliance team is a dedicated team working to ensure a regulatory compliance in each jurisdiction uh, where we're offering wagers. Uh, we have people uh, located in New York and Denver, and we're working seven days a week during key parts of the uh, sporting calendar to make sure we're always on top of all the markets being offered in each jurisdiction. We use a combination of technology and manual monitoring to make sure that only approved wagers are taken. And we're always working with our technology team uh, to improve that, that system and make sure uh, we're getting better at improving. Uh, we work with our training team to handle requests for new markets and leagues and ensure everything we're offering is in line with jurisdictional approvals. And we work directly with our compliance and legal teams to request new markets in each jurisdiction uh, with the various regulators there. Next slide, please. Uh, so just want to take a minute here to cover points betting, which is a unique uh, market offering uh, in the United States by points bet. And what points betting does is it multiplies your stake amount by uh, the amount of your win. So for example, if you wagered $1 per run on over 10 total runs in a baseball game, and the result was 12 total runs in the game, you'd win two times your wager uh, for a $2 win. Likewise, if the total runs were eight, you'd lose two times your wager uh, for a $2 loss. Uh, as you can see in the display here, clients are able to use the stop loss adjuster to adjust their uh, risk tolerance to what they're most comfortable with and ensure that clients are only betting uh, what they are uh, comfortable wagering. Uh, thank you for your time, Madam Chairman and Commissioners, and uh, I'll turn it over to Lauren Crow, who can give us a Thank you, Andrew. And also thank you, Madam Chairman and uh, Commissioners, for the opportunity to discuss the points about technology stuff. Uh, I don't know if it's me, but I'm getting a lot of feedback. Yeah, Lauren, we're we're getting a lot of uh, other noise there. This guy right here. It must be the. Let me. Let me. So everybody's here. We can hear your conversation. I want to alert you to that. Yeah. Um. So you'll need to mute because it is a public yeah. meeting. I want to protect private conversations. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll move into a, a quieter location. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, we couldn't tell who was speaking and it could be folks from not your team. So it's all good. Um, Mr. Moreno, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, just give us one moment and I'll make sure Lauren can begin the, the, the demonstration very quickly. Commissioners, you're all set right now. Thank you. Michelle O'Brien, you and I both had that look like, is it us? <laughs> Apologies there, it seems that my, my uh, microphone all the time, so I, just, I never know if it's me or somebody else. Yeah, so it might be Mr. Crow that you're getting feedback. Um, let's see, try again. Mr. Crow, who's speaking? Lauren. All right, apologies for that. Um, again, thank you, Madam Board of Commissioners. My name is Lauren Crow. Hello, am I audible? Uh, you are audible. There seems to be a little bit of background noise, but it doesn't look like it's coming from you. Um, I don't know if anybody's seeing a yellow screen pop up. Okay. Actually, actually, he's going in and out, Madam Chair. He is a bit, isn't he? And then, but there's also a buzz behind him. I, I, think, think, that, I think that's also mis coming from Mr. Crow's end. From Mr. Whom? Mr. Apologies Crow. there. Am I audible now? Are Very things better? Good. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Skinner. It, good morning. Apologies again, it wouldn't be a live demo without a little bit of um, interest from the technology. Um, thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners for the opportunity to discuss uh, PointsBet with you. My name is Lauren Crow. I'm the Director of Engineering Operations here at PointsBet. I'm gonna be walking you through a platform demonstration to showcase some of our responsible gaming and wagering features that were previously uh, mentioned by my colleagues here. So let me, Share my screen. And we will go from there. All right. So first I wanna walk you through a demonstration of, of a recorded demonstration. Well, we've lost him again. Commissioner Skinner, you're muted. Demonstration of our sign up process, PII is Share data, but it shows you all of um, the required steps to, to sign up on our platform. Ms. Moreno, so as, as I you'll think see here. Okay, Mr. Crow, if you can just, I think if you sit closer, we hear you better, but you are going in and out a bit. Thanks. Madam Chairwoman, if you just give me a moment, I'll. I'll, I'll no. Um, and we have no problem with it whatsoever. Thank you. Apologies. Apologies again for that, Commissioners and Madam Chairwoman. We uh, unfortunately had some some latency there, so Lauren's presentation was uh, not not coming through clearly. He's relocating to a, a room with a bit of a better connection, so hopefully we can give this another try in the next few seconds, if that's okay with you. No problem.
Apologies for the interruption there, Andrew, I'm back. Thanks, Lauren. Do you want to start sharing your screen now? Absolutely. Apologies for the interruption there. Thanks again, um, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. My name is Lauren Crow. I'm the Director of Engineering Operations here at Points, but um, I'm going to walk you through a demonstration of the platform and some of the RG uh, responsible gaming and wagering features that my colleagues have spoken about previously. Start sharing my screen now. So in, in, in an effort to keep PII um, private, we're doing the sign-up demonstration out of one of our UAT environments with test data. But this will walk you through the standard sign-up process, all the required fields we gather, and what it looks like to a new user signing up. So as you can see, we're gathering all the necessary information to pass this new user through our KYC process. Requiring that the user select all of the check boxes for the attestations um, required by the local jurisdiction. Clicking join points bet. This is simulating the call to our KYC provider. And upon successfully passing KYC, the user will be logged in. And in this jurisdiction, given the opportunity to set limits immediately upon signing into the site. I'll move on to a demonstration of the platform itself. So I will log in with my personal test account in production. As you can see, this is the MFA additional multi-factor authentication that we mentioned earlier. So I'm getting a text message to my cell phone, entering my MFA code, verifying that it's my, me and logging in. So as mentioned by Rachel earlier, if you scroll to the bottom of our page, you'll see that responsible gambling is a clear link here. You'll be able to see the various limits that we offer. And this is configurable on our platform. As mentioned previously, uh, we own our own technology, so we have the flexibility to add and adjust limits as necessary. So we spent, if I wanna set a spin limit for myself for over seven days, I don't want to spend more than $100. I can enter that here. I can set a spin limit and then I can confirm my spin limit here. And then it's reflected there. One point of note on our um, limits, we do not let you make the limits less restrictive during the period of time that they're enforced. So you can make them more restrictive if you would like to, but if you would like to adjust these um, in a less restrictive manner, so letting yourself spend more, you would have to wait until the expiration of the time period mentioned here. As previously discussed, if you go to account history, you can also see your wager limits and when you set them. So I just sent, set that spin limit for one week at $100. Let me give you a demonstration of placing a wager on the platform. So if I want to select Columbus Blue Jackets money line, I would click on that. I can select how much I would like to wager, place now, and confirm. And again, wagering activity is reflected on the account, on the account history table. So 
we can look at my bet placement here that I just wagered for $10 and the bet slip is, is there. As you can see, I already have a settled bet in here as well, settled as a win for the, I placed a wager on um, Dallas Stars money line yesterday and it was settled as a win and you can see the credit here. And lastly, I'll demonstrate the points betting option that Andrew Menino walked us through earlier. So if I go into this points betting and I want to say that the total will be over 131 for the game, I can place a dollar wager as in the stop loss at the moment is set at the max win and max loss level is set at $50. But as Andrew explained earlier, I'm able to adjust this to my comfortable level of max win and max loss. And then I can place my wager. Okay, that's the demonstration of the platform. Thank you for your time, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Sure. I will Mr. Crow, before, you take it, before you take it down, I ask a question, please. And I may have missed it, but I don't think I did. I read in the application that you have an I, uh, icon where you can get information on each bet or each own. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? And more information on what I apologize. You know, uh, uh, you know the little icon for I uh, for information describing how the bet works. Do you do you know what I mean? So, there, on, yeah. on points betting in particular, uh, Lauren, if you go back to the game page, there, uh, I believe what the uh, chairwoman is referring to is the. Uh, information tab next okay. to each wager type. Yeah. So go ahead and, and expand main wagers and then right next to money line three way, there you are. Yeah, and perhaps others had that, but they didn't mention it. And so I don't think I've seen it, but commissioners can correct me. But that's really helpful. Really helpful. Thank you. And then could you just go back to your home page if I were to open up? very first time to points bet, what would I see? Is this what I would see? Yes, this is, a, this is our homepage. So I'm just looking for responsible gaming. I'm sure it's there somewhere. Is that the bottom? Yeah, the RG icon there. Yeah, so that's right on your home your homepage. Yeah, excellent. That's correct. Thank you. Any questions, uh, commissioners, for on the technology? We tend to hold our questions except for this piece. So thank you, Mr. Crow. Commissioners, all set. All right. Thanks. Really helpful. Thank you for your time again, and apologies about the technical difficulties. Um, Andrew, I'll turn it back to you. No apologies needed. Good. Thank you very much, Lauren, and thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Commission, for your, uh, your your understanding in our time of technical need. Um, uh, if there are no further questions at this moment, uh, that, that is the end of our prepared remarks, demonstration, and presentation. Uh, we once again thank Madam Chairwoman and the Commissioners for their time, not just this morning, but throughout the process. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to, to work with all of you and, and watch you work as well. Uh, we respectfully ask that the Commission grant Points Bet Massachusetts a Category 3 mobile sports wagering license and issue a temporary finding of suitability. And we're more than happy to answer any more questions at this time. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, back, Commissioners, it's uh, just 11:10. It makes sense for us to go to our in house experts. Yeah, I see some nodding. Good. Um, thank you again to Points Bet for its. Uh, presentation of this application and demonstration of technology. We'll turn to 4B in the agenda, the presentations and analysis from our in-house experts. Turn first to GLI on the technical components. And who do we have this morning? There, I see Joe, good morning. You do see me because I don't see me. <laughs> I actually don't see you. That was a little <laughs> bit of a lie. 
Yeah. Right, I see hold on one sec. There, there you go. You go. <laughs> that was weird. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, I like the way I just let me introduce GLI um, first to write and set gaming technical standards, which are now considered to be the industry benchmark worldwide. GLI has continuously responded to the industry by innovating new standards and testing, allowing regulators to feel confident that they are providing a safe, responsible method of revenue generation for their stakeholders and preservation of integrity. And uh, GLI has been consulting with us all along. Thank you, Joe. And this is um, for right now, Joe, the, the last of our applications. So uh, thank you for uh, this morning's presentation. Uh, thanks for having us, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is Joseph Barman, Director of Client Solutions for GLI. I'll give a overview of the SMIDL verification and verification process regarding mobile applications and other digital platforms approved by the, to be approved by the Commission. The SMIDL process includes the following. Uh, if it's a platform we're familiar with, which in this case points that we are, a modification list from the last submission to one or more of the U.S. jurisdictions requested and reviewed to set the project plan for Massachusetts, considering any changes to the platform and all specific Massachusetts rules and regulations. During that process, we will review the technology architecture documentation, which is a complete, comprehensive, and technically accurate description and explanation of the sports wagering systems. This includes a description of all the hardware devices and virtual servers, description of all server and client hardware hardware mo uh, software modules, including all software versions, the layout of all the network communication between the various software and hardware modules, and explanation of all third-party integrated systems. Post the technical documentation review, critical files regarding compliance will be identified and documented. Then a complete project plan is put in place, including, uh, sorry, taking into account the unique architecture and design of the platform and the specific Massachusetts Gaming Commission rules and regulations. The lab will run a supervised compilation of those source files, the signature of those files and compilation steps and the signatures of the compiled code. Once complete, the source code can be submitted for testing in the lockdown environment. July reviewed the player account management platform known as PAM for registration age, identification, verification, account controls, payments, reporting, responsible gaming controls, required disclosures, and geolocation. Geolocation testing commits in two parts, a field test to verify borders through sampling along the entire border while completing edge case technical tests. The field test will also cover any other restricted areas defined by the MGC. A submersive workaround detection will commence in the lab, including but not limited to VPN and proxy uses, usage, GPS spoofing, code manipulation, and man-in-the-middle attacks. GLI will verify the sportsbook in total for markets, point spreads, bet acceptance, and their corresponding time stamps and logging. We'll verify the enforcement of betting limits in all edge cases, the pre-event and live data feeds, post-event bet settling, the corresponding time stamps and all logging and reporting. We will review the change management process and procedures. After the technical checkoffs meant GLI certifications can be issued when GLI verifies the changes made for the Massachusetts specific deployments, including source code differential and change testing to the last reviewed version. And, <coughs> excuse me, GLI has evaluated that the product has met all Massachusetts specific requirements. After certifications are issued and the MGC accepts them, field verification will be conducted in the conjunction with the MGC. Procedure will be finalized uh, in the upcoming weeks. In fact, the Cat One uh, Cat Ones are kicked off today. Um, during that time, the following will commence, or will be kicking off. Uh, actually kick off tomorrow. Gabe is actually traveling today, excuse me. <laughs> uh, verification at the production server, including verification of all critical file signatures, re reviews of the internal controls and procedures to operate the book, uh, check technology for configuration such as proper setup of roles and user rate uh, assignment, potentially interview key employees, key personnel to ensure that they know and will follow procedures from the internal controls. At this point, they've met the technical requirements for operations of a sportsbook in the Commonwealth. This concludes our presentation for the submittal verification and verification process. Thank you. Questions for Joe, commissioners? 
All set. Okay. All right. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you later. Okay. Now we're going to turn to IEB and um, report on suitability. And I see that we have Director Lilios this morning. Good morning, Loretta. Hi. Good morning, Chair, and good morning, Commissioners. Uh, the IEB submitted a report on preliminary suitability of PointsBet Massachusetts LLC. As you know, this applicant seeking the Category 3 uh, untethered uh, sports wagering license. The IB performed this review for preliminary suitability in accordance with the standards and criteria set forth in 205 CMR 215.01 subsection 2. A full investigation for du durable suitability has not been performed at this time. Uh, Prior to the review, the licensing division in conjunction with the IEB performed a scoping review of the applicant under Chapter 23N, Section 5B, and identified three entities and four individuals to submit to qualification in connection with this application. And those qualifiers are listed on pages one and two of the IEB's report. Uh, the licensing division has reviewed the application for deficiencies. There are no substantial deficiencies outstanding. The applicant has been uh, extremely responsive uh, in that communication with the licensing division. Uh, as I mentioned, the IAB performed the review in accordance with the governing regulation, which is set forth on page three of the report. And we, we utilized a team that included contract investigators, including former members of the State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit. And in this instance, we used a team from the contract firm of Littman Gerson Associates, LLP, or LGA, uh, also a CPA and business advisor firm. Uh, we uh, made this arrangement to utilize LGA. Uh, we made the arrangement with RSM in instances uh, where RSM provides uh, services to the applicant. In all instances, the work of the contract team uh, was conducted in collaboration with members of the IEB and under the oversight and uh, supervision of the IEB. Our review for preliminary suitability includes a summary of points bets licensing status as disclosed in this application, a summary of its self-reported compliance history in other jurisdictions. Uh, not surprisingly, points bet Massachusetts has no discipline history as it is to date a non-operational company, but the applicant did disclose discipline history regarding the activities of its related companies in Indiana, Iowa, and Australia. Our review in the report also includes a report of the self-disclosed pending litigation valued over $100,000 and two matters uh, pending in uh, federal district court in Colorado and in New Jersey uh, were reported by the applicant. Our review also included an open source review of the applicant and individual, the individual qualifiers, but not the other entity qualifiers and links to various media articles that are representative uh, of what was identified appear in the report. The team from LGS also prepared a report on preliminary suitability in accordance with the criteria of the governing regulation. Their report appears as exhibit one. Uh, they review disclosed financial information of the applicant, in this case supplemented by financial filings of the publicly traded ultimate parent company that's traded on the Australian Securities Exchange. And that is consistent with, with what we did with other publicly traded companies in the U.S. Uh, utilizing um, a, a counterpart uh, um, data, uh, uh, data collection. Uh, L, um, LGA also presented uh, financial ratios in its report, reviewed the forecasting submissions submitted by the applicant in its uh, general application. And uh, Mr. Russ Vogel from, uh, from the company is here to uh, discuss its report today. Uh, we also have members of the uh, contract team of attorney banks available today if you have any questions. So that's my summary. Commissioners, do you have questions for Director Williams? 
Commissioner O'Brien? No, just I figured when we get when we circle back to the section by section, there's a couple of um, I think there were a couple of things in the suitability report, I, probably in executive session, but I figured I'd wait until we circle back to it. Okay, we'll do that. And Director Lilly, as you remember, your team will be available. Yes, of course. Okay, excellent. Commissioners, anything else? Okay. Thank you, Director Lilly. So at this time, as um, Director Lilios alluded, we would um, normally be uh, turning to RSM because of their internal conflict. Um, they, um, we will be hearing from um, Littman Gerson, referred to as, um, my apologies, LGA. And this is a member of the RSM Alliance and an independently owned member firm that has been engaged to perform for the MGC. And we have Ross Yogo. Good morning, Mr. Yogo. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. I'm going to share my screen now. Thank you. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Yogo is correct. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the commission, thank you. Uh, my name is Ross Yogel and I'm a partner at LGA. I lead our business valuation and financial forensics team within the business advisory group. I have 11 years of experience in financial analysis, business valuation, due diligence in conducting financial forensic investigations. <clears throat> I just wanted to say that LGA appreciates the opportunity to present to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. We understand the importance of the licensing process and the importance of these meetings. Please note this presentation is based on documentation received as of November 21st, 2022. The discussion prepared by the LGA team is based on our preliminary research to date and is subject to change if new information becomes available. Questions posed to our team may require further research if we're unable to respond to a question before the end of this meeting, we will circulate a response to the Commission as soon as practical. So as the Madam Chair had indicated, <clears throat> LGA has been asked to join the meeting and make a presentation on certain aspects of PointsBet Massachusetts LLC's application. Please note that LGA is not presenting on all aspects of the application. Specifically, LGA has been asked to provide insights based on our experience and research into the following specific sections. Uh, B2D, the description of the applicant's sports wagering operation within Massachusetts specifically. Uh, C2, the applicant's projected Massachusetts revenue. G3, the applicant's financial stability and integrity to operate within the state of Massachusetts. And we will also provide general observations that may benefit the commission in their review of the applicant. Uh, the three areas that LGA will speak to today include an overview of the sports betting market within Massachusetts and across the United States, and how LGA utilized certain market data to test financial projections, including the applicant's projected GGR or gross gaming revenue, their market share, and hold percentages. We will also discuss the applicant's current capital structure and their liquidity position. Uh, so portions of section two and three will be reserved for the executive session due to information being proprietary or competitively sensitive. So similar to other presentations that have been delivered, I'll begin by providing some insight into how third party equity analysts are estimating the current market 
um, and the hold percentages within Massachusetts. LGA utilized market research to test the reasonableness of the applicant's financial projections submitted for category three untethered licensing. So as illustrated on this slide, slide four, the two resources that were used for primary databases were Deutsche Bank Equity Research Report within the gaming industry and the Truth Securities Equity Research Report also within the gaming industry, and both were published in October of 2022. Uh, the reports show some differing views on the Massachusetts addressable market. So this includes TAM, which is the total addressable market, um, and differing growth rates as well expected into the future. So I'll just mention that no one has a crystal ball in estimating the total opportunity for the sports betting market and the figures within these reports may be surpassed or less than what is actually achieved. Given the evolving nature of online sports wagering and the varying um, number of platforms within different jurisdictions, it is difficult to predict the ultimate composition of the marketplace. Uh, even after conducting extensive market research, perfecting is an imperfect science, but we can say that the Massachusetts market is being viewed as a lucrative long-term growth market by operators and industry analysts. So because we are evaluating a category three applicant, we imputed a high and low range of the anticipated market size within the Commonwealth for specifically online sports betting. And we use the total addressable market from the prior slide, slide four, which shows the total addressable market. So a high and low range was imputed based on the percentage of online sports betting within jurisdictions that have legalized both online and retail sports betting. And so this calculation enables us to make comparisons to the applicant projections prepared. And I'll note that the truest equity research report indicates a ramp up period within Massachusetts in the 2023 to the 2024 period. So this means that the truest equity report uh, may consider less than 12 months of realized market activity in 2023. Moving on to slide six. Uh, we've provided some insight into the total online market within the United States. The figures presented in this graph include both online sports betting and also internet gaming. And it's over a trailing 12 month period from June, 2022. I'll note that the percentages between sports, online sports betting and internet gaming are approximately 47% and 53%. So online sports betting would be 47% represented within here and 53% towards internet gaming. Also to note that Barstool and Penn are referenced twice, which is likely due to the acquisition of two sports books. On slide seven, uh, we're essentially taking the information from that prior graph and showing it as of a point in time as of June of 2022. So the current U.S. online market is dominated by three major players. FanDuel has a 33% market share, followed by BetMGM at 21% market and DraftKings at 19%. They are the, the three top players within the online market of gaming. Um, I just wanted to note that the other category within this pie graph includes several sports books that have less than 1% of the total market share. And they would include, but are not limited to scoreboard, win bet, sportsbook Rhode Island, STN Sports, and Parks, just to name uh, a few of those companies within the other sports books within the other category. <clears throat> so
So this line graph represents the hold percentage over time. LGA utilized information from other states and third party research to develop a benchmark for hold percentage. Put simply, hold percentage is the revenue held by the sports book after winning bets have been put paid out. Hold percentage has been fluctuating over time as the industry matures and new jurisdictions launch. Um, this shows all the jurisdictions over the last 18 months presented in a rolling average to smooth out the hold rates. And you can see it's over a three trailing three month time period in a six month trailing time period. Uh, moving on to slide nine, this is the median hold percentage for all United States jurisdiction sports, sports books over the last 18 months. So this scatter plot shows the median hold percentage by operation based on the number of sports books in each jurisdiction. We've considered a, a range of seven to 12% hold rate is the most likely range within competitive states, which is within the middle of this chart. And the Commonwealth would be considered a competitive state based on the number of applications that have been submitted. Uh, I'll now provide just a high level overview of our observation regarding the applicant's financial projections in the company, in the parent company. <clears throat> so the applicant points bet Massachusetts LLC will be the local online gaming arm of the parent company points bet holdings limited, which is as discussed a publicly traded company listed on the Australian stock exchange. As seen in section 4.1 of exhibit one of I, the IEB report, we've reviewed publicly available financial statements for PointsBet Holdings Limited to understand its liquidity profile, which we felt necessary to provide a holistic view for the commission. <clears throat> so moving on uh, to the applicant submitted projections. Um, the applicant submitted projections for five years indicated as year one through year five. And this was based on a proprietary methodology and within their, their experience within other jurisdictions. Uh, we reviewed the applicant's revenue projection information and compared it to market research provided by the Deutsche Bank Equity Research Report and Truth Securities Equity Research Report which I had previously discussed and gone over. <clears throat> For the revenue projection section, an executive session may be warranted as LGA's plan discussion contains competitively sensitive information specific to PointsBet Massachusetts's proprietary projections and their estimated market share within the Commonwealth. So given the, the sensitive nature of the information, I'll just provide a broad overview of the applicant's projections and I'll reserve further sensitive information for the executive session. So the applicant in accordance with section C.2 has submitted a financial forecast for operations within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The submitted forecast contains three scenarios, a base case scenario, a bull case scenario, and a bear case scenario. In each of the submitted scenarios, the applicant provided a five-year financial projection of the sports wagering activity within the Commonwealth, and it covers the estimated handle, the gross win, the net gaming revenue, and the, um, the EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. The applicant did not self-report an anticipated market share capture rate. So we use the imputed estimated range of the market based on our previous discussion in, in those two equity research reports. Uh, at a high level, the gross gaming revenue projections and resulting market share are within the range of the market share capture rate 
that the applicant has achieved within other United States jurisdictions. As the commission is aware, revenue is closely tied to hold percentage. Points bet Massachusetts uh, hold, hold percentage assumption is conservative and it's in line with what one would expect in a competitive online sports betting operation. Again, due to the confidential nature of the applicant's projections, I'll reserve further commentary for an executive session. And my last point during our review is that during the latest public fiscal year filing for the parent company as of June 2022 for PointsBet Holdings Limited, um, the company held 357 million United States dollars in cash and cash equivalents and $12, 12 million dollars in uh, capital lease obligations for their liquidity profile. So this concludes LGA's public portion of our presentation. Uh, I'll stay on for the commission and, and if PointsBet has any uh, questions as well. If you could bring, take down your slides. Okay. Trying to do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Yonville. Any questions for him at this point, commissioners? Okay. So um, again, Mr. Yonville, thank you for recognizing that um, we may need you for an executive session. Am I correct, commissioners, that will want that so that we can put that on Mr. Grossman's list? I see Mr. Maynard, yes, Commissioner Maynard. Anyone else? So I... Um, we would like that executive session if, if it's appropriate, Councilor Grossman. Okay. It is now 20 of 12. Does it make sense to take a brief break and then we'll come back to do our section by section analysis before a lunch break as we've done in the past? Yeah, that would be, that would be good for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moreno and commissioners all set with that plan. So, um, we'll reconvene around 10 of, of 12, 11.50. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Dave. Excellent. We can get started. This is a reconvening of Massachusetts Green um, Commission's meeting uh, number 424, holding this meeting um, virtually, so I'll do a roll call. Good morning again, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, good morning. And good morning again, Commissioner Hill. Good morning. Morning again, Commissioner Skinner. Good morning. And good morning again, Commissioner Maynard. Good morning, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much. And again, as I indicated, after I reminded everybody this morning that it's January 17th already, and we convened earlier at 10 a.m. We have made our way through our agenda to item 4C, which is the review. Oops, excuse me. I must have hit something. Um, review and evaluation of each application for category three untethered sports wagering operator license that has been submitted by our applicant today, PointsBet Massachusetts LLC. <clears throat> Commissioners, um, we'll now begin our overall evaluation. Um, as we've done in the past, we should consider whether the applicant's response and proposal meets expectations exceeds expectations or fails to meet expectations. In this context though, since we have to consider the applicants holistically at the conclusion of this individual review, this initial assessment as to whether the sections of the application um, have met expectations will be preliminary in nature, just to see whether we have a general consensus and our um, assessment is subject to modification once we've had a chance to move through our evaluations of each application in the <clears throat> to have the broader landscape in greater focus. A reminder, commissioners, one or more commissioners may seek supplemental information from the applicant to any component of this application. As part of the process, again, as we've done prior, we should consider any conditions that we might like to see in the event that a license is awarded to this applicant. And a reminder to this um, applicant, our process um, is expected to begin tomorrow afternoon um, and then proceed through the 19th. And we expect perhaps to um, finish up on the 20th. And this is where we would identify any variation between the applicant's proposal in this category as it relates to the others. So turning to the application itself, commissioners, and we'll look at first section B. Do you have the documents in front of you? Section B begins on page 24 of the 170 page document. We'll get started. Questions with respect to section B. I'll start off. Um, in your uh, section B, you do indicate that there are multiple redundancies that you use to um, prevent prohibited sports events and other content from reaching the site. Um, if you could just go into um, those redundancies and, and including at the feed and website level, please. Thank you for your uh, question. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll commend you to uh, Andrew Menino, our trading, our, our manager of trading compliance, who can go into those redundancies further. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman, for the question there. I think, um, you know, we have a series of, uh, of blockers that we use at both the feed and the website level to prevent uh, prohibited markets from reaching the website. Uh, we work with our data provider partners to block on their end. We're able to block on our end to prevent creation of prohibited markets. Um, and, and we work to uh, 
monitor our site regularly, both using technology and manually to ensure that only approved uh, wager types are available on site. Okay, any questions, follow-ups on that, commissioners? I, I have a different question, Madam Chair. Okay, Commissioner Lane, yep. At the time the application was submitted, um, you were expecting to go live in Ohio uh, and Maryland. Have you went live in either of those jurisdictions? Yes, we have gone live in both. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I, Mr. O'Brien, I have a, a couple questions and if you said this during the demo, my apologies. Um, but when I was looking through what um you said that you offered in terms of what sets you apart you talked about a couple of things like points betting parlay booster tokens um the name of bet um can you just describe those in a little more detail for me and again if you did it already i apologize um i just had some questions particularly the parlay booster token with the getting the two days at the two tokens a day to the customers i just wonder if you could talk about that in relation to responsible gaming too Thanks for your question, Commissioner. Um, I'll, I'll direct you towards Rick to discuss the contents of specific uh, promotional items and, and going forward. And I just also want to stress, though, that you know all of our promotions are compliant with local register local regulations. So um, obviously, it's not a one size fits all across all jurisdictions. Um, what, what we saw, what we showed you in the uh, presentation and demonstration were just examples from other jurisdictions like Ohio, for example. But uh, to get into more detail, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll shoot over to Rick. Yeah, happy to provide some detail here. Um, I believe the three uh, call-outs or I guess pieces to explore further were name a bet, parlay boost, and points betting. Those are three unique features in our product. Um, so name a bet is an opportunity for customers to request a compliant market that might not be on site and see if we can uh, price it up and put it there for everyone. So if someone wanted to do a crazy points plus rebounds, minus assists, plus turnovers, for whatever reason that they wanted to do that, they could request it. And it helps them feel kind of engaged in the product and customers who actually get a name of that up on site certainly love that and kind of gross about it. It's a little badge of honor. On the Parlay Boost side, um, that was a, a token given out so for anyone who creates a parlay that day, they don't have to use it. Um, they have the functionality and the option to give it a little bit of a boost. So they might build two parlays in a day. They really feel good about one of those and they want to increase those odds slightly. It gives them that opportunity. That's all configured, uh, configured on the back end as well. So based on customer profiling, you know, we might start at a default with one or two per person, but based on their betting habits, uh, we can either restrict those or we can increase them or we can kind of keep the default as is. And did you want me to dive into points betting as well? Just being conscious of time. Uh, yeah, just so before you move on to that, so the yeah. the name of that, how do you do that to make sure that you're compliant with what the book that the MGC has approved? That's what I was trying to figure out is they're asking sure. for something, but it's got to be within the book. So where do you make that call as opposed to at what point do you have to come back and, and say to us, is this okay? I would say it's all manually done. So when the requests come in, they're kind of filtered and reach our trading team. And so they obviously are very familiar with what is allowed in the state. If there are any questions they can liaison with our team and ask. Usually it's uh, in just a small variation of an existing market that's already been approved. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. That's sorry. Yeah, just, I, we, just build on what Rick's saying there. You know, we see that as the trading team, those messages come directly to us whenever clients uh, request a market, including their jurisdiction and the sport and the wager that they're looking for. Um, and then we can compare that to existing regulations, ensure that we're not offering things that aren't approved. But as Rick alluded to, the majority of times it's variations on already approved uh, markets, such as a player's rebounds over under who's not already been listed on site. And then in terms of the, the tokens, um, at, at page 57, when you sort of described them, it almost looked like an automatic two tokens get you know, pushed out to everybody every day. It sounds like you maybe tweak that and that's not automatically going out to everybody. 
Yeah, just to reiterate what I said, the um, you could think of almost that as the default for new customers, and then it's okay. completely configurable. So based on the betting habits of someone, if we feel they're not into it, or for whatever restrictive purposes we want to restrict that, we can take it all the way down to zero uh, if we want to, and do it in some cases. Um, if it's a uh, you know certain uh, higher staking client or VIP customer, we might give them three in a specific day, um, whatever that might be. But it's the point is, I guess it's completely configurable on the back end. And Commissioner O'Brien, just to add to what my colleagues have um, spoken to here today, I think it's important to note that what's most important to PointsBet is making sure anything we put out there in the way of a promotion is in alignment with whatever the regulating um, regulating body is in that jurisdiction. So we've obviously adapted that in all 14 states that we've gone into. Um, again, this was just sort of an example and again, could be completely configured based on guidance that um, the Commonwealth would provide. Okay. Can I do a follow up um, on the name of that? I, is it just that one time or does it go into your stay in your offerings? Uh, it's very specific to that moment in time. Usually it's about a specific player in a specific matchup. Yeah. Um, so after it expires, it's removed from site. So it's specific to that as opposed to type. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Sorry. I have one more. Sorry, if you go back to page 37, um, you were talking about some of the procedures um, and you talk about a hardship request, saying if it's going to take longer than 90 days to resolve, you would communicate to the commission and ask, et cetera. And this may have come up and I missed it in other applicants. Is that, and maybe GLI can answer this too, is that a standard practice in the industry in terms of if it's a complicated fix, they come back and just ask for a delay in implementation? Yeah, thank you for thank thank you for the question, Commissioner. We 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 actively work with you know regulatory partners, so you know we don't necessarily view it as even making a request as as so much as it is is it is keeping them apprised of our progress. Now there will be times when it's, it can be too difficult uh, to to hit a specific deadline, but we would always come with you know a sign of progress and just kind of where we are in, in the process of making that fix. So um, it's it is relatively standard uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but again, we don't you know like, like to take too much advantage of it. We kind of just treat it as a way of, again, treating our relationship with a regulator as a partnership. I don't know if anybody from GLI is on the call who can. If not, I can table it until we get back there. That was all I had, yeah. Madam Chair. Okay, um, Joe is on, but he may be just right now busy, so we can you can go back to him. All right, commissioners, are there questions? For, oh, there's Joe. You want to Oops, sorry, Commissioner Brian. Hi, yeah, Joe. The on page thirty-seven, they just talk about hardship requests. Um, if they're going to have to have something, a feature, an issue that takes um, longer than ninety days to resolve, I'm assuming that's a pretty standard practice in the industry, but we haven't really talked about it. I'd have to defer to a client, but I'll get the answer and come back. To, uh, sorry, to one of my colleagues and I'll get back and I'll get back okay. to the answer to you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Other co questions, commissioners? I'll ask a question um, while you're looking at your notes. Um, the question that's come up, you see that I think it was in B3A and you have a listing of um, enumerated items that rewards points can be earned on every single bet and redeemed for free bets to be used immediately. I hear that you no longer use terminology risk-free. Uh, what, what exactly does a free bet mean? I know that we're all working, um, you're working as an industry, we're working as regulators to address that terminology. Madam Chairwoman, this is Rachel Casper, VP of Legal. Um, the, the change was obviously, I think, driven by the fact that PointsBet is, again, very in touch with the industry and trying to make changes in alignment with um, what customers desire. I think there was some confusion in the market. And so what we've uh, sort of moved towards was a free bid itself, right, is that there is nothing that the customer has to do in order to obtain that. And I think, you know, historically, the combination of risk and free together um, sent a message to patrons 
um, across the industry that was not well understood. And I think through terms and conditions and everything else and the use of free vet, um, that's been more clear. However, again, we've moved away from that as well in jurisdictions where the regulator has said that is not clear enough for our citizens. So where you have, where you do use it, the theory is it's truly free. Where? Madam Chairwoman, that is correct, yes. Okay. And you've eliminated the language risk-free altogether. So thank you. You're welcome. But you do have um, jurisdictions I know that you're operating in where free vets can't be used at all. Can you tell me what you use instead? Yes, Commissioner Chairwoman, it's uh, not so much that certain promotional activity is prohibited. I think it's more that certain regulators are restricting the way that it's actually communicated to patrons. Right. So I think the, the best example is the Ohio Casino Control Commission where we recently um, launched in and their diligence around that communication to, to the citizens of the state. They wanted it to be abundantly clear and they kept using the word conspicuous, right? That the responsible gaming message was there and that whatever we were putting out into the ether was absolutely true on its face, that that messaging wasn't hidden. Um, and again, the terms and conditions always support everything that we put out into the space, um, but the Ohio Casino Control Commission, rightfully so, took a different stance and gave that direction. And as such, operators have followed suit. And I think it's just showing um, the variation in, in the regulatory landscape. And, and again, operators, and just like us as point, but uh, adapt to that based on, on where we operate. Ms. Casper, do you mind if I just ask those? So, because I haven't had a chance to do my homework with respect to Ohio. Uh, <clears throat> if we were to be in Ohio and to look at a points bet app, where today we saw a glimpse of free bets and we saw in the application in points bet, are you using the terminology free bets in Ohio or are you using some other terminology for those promotions? Mm -hmm. Madam Chairwoman, I will have to defer to my colleague Rick just to make sure I don't speak out of turn, but my um, understanding is that we've moved to um, that credit, but Rick, I will turn it over to you to give confirmation there. Confirmed, yes, that is correct. We use the terminology bet credit in Ohio in replacement of that free bet terminology. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, commissioners? Well, I'll give you a shout out. I like that you acknowledge the awards that you've received, including um, being the sports wagering operator to watch. Um, that sounds like a good position to be in. Uh, so congratulations to you on, on, on the progress that you've made with respect to innovations. Anything else with respect to section B, commissioners? Commissioner Hill. Madam uh, Chair. I'd like to think that I've been educating myself on all types of bets through this process that we've been going through over the last six months. But I have to be honest, I'm still not totally understanding uh, points betting and how it works. Can someone like give me an example from point A to point B, how this works, both positive and negative? Please. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to walk you through that, Commissioner. Um, understand that uh, points betting is a little different than what you see in, in other wager types. It, it is proprietary and so uh, it's not something you've seen out there before. So I'd be happy to walk you through uh, some of the bet types we offer there. Is it something you'd rather do in executive session? No, I think it's fine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the way points betting works is that you're wagering on how right you'll be. So for instance, if you wagered on the total number of points in an NBA game, you might wager over 200. The more right you are, the more you're going to be rewarded there. In other words, you are betting per point over. Uh, so for instance, you might bet $1 per point on over 200. And then if the game goes to 210, you win 10 times your stake. If the game goes to 220, you win 20 times your stake. Or if the game goes to 250, you'll win 50 times your stake there. Uh, and likewise, 
loss. If the game's at 190, you lose 10 times your stake. If the game ends at 150, you could lose 50 times your stake. Um, and so that's where that stop loss comes in, where clients may who may not be comfortable taking that large of a risk can reduce it and uh, keep their 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 total risk within uh, set boundaries that they're comfortable with. I understand it a little better now. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you. Commissioners, other questions on section B? I think Joe is back with a with an answer, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, there you go, Joe. Well, I, I do have an answer to Commissioner O'Brien's question. And while hardship requests aren't certainly to be taken lightly by any sense, but the uh, uh, they are uh, available for the operator to uh, basically fix something that isn't compliant and 90 days is more than normal for uh, that type of return window. Joe, you just your voice lowered right around the 90 oh, days. Please, yeah, 90 days is them. totally normal for our, that type of return window. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. So can I um, learn from you commissioners whether this um, applicant has met expectations with respect to section B? Madam Chair, I believe the applicant has met expectations for Section B. I agree. I agree. Commissioner Skinner? I responded that I agree. Oh, I couldn't quite hear you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. And I, I thought it was very, a very strong um, section. Uh, so I agree as well. It was um, really quite a pleasure to be. Thank you. Okay. Then moving to section C. Questions, Commissioner? I can start, Thank Madam you. Chair. Um, yes. I'm always interested in community engagement. And as I was reading your application, uh, I was hoping maybe that I would have seen a little bit more community engagement in other jurisdictions. So I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate where you have been more engaged uh, with the community. I, I noticed as one of the um, comments that was made, and this is a theme that we've heard throughout uh, the application process, that is an untethered uh, mobile operator, you know, you're limited because you're not here in Boston, you're not physically here. And I understand that. But what we've seen from other applicants where they have actually reached out in other jurisdictions they partnered with food banks. They've partnered, um, so I'll use Boston, you know, Jimmy Fund, the Red Cross, PMC, things like that, where they partner with them and, and uh, work with them. So can you just enlighten me what you have done in terms of community engagement and not necessarily uh, cross, I don't know the word I want to use, but not necessarily just helping your brand, but actually helping the community for what you will be doing business in. I, I very much appreciate the question, Commissioner. Um, you know, I, I, I do want to stress that, you know, we view uh, our responsibility to the communities that we operate in as, as quite serious. And that ranges from, you know, our obligation with responsible gambling to just our general obligations to, to respect and invest in our community around us. Um, you know, that being said, I think we, we're most interested in very long-term uh, partnerships and commitments. Uh, I know Amanda Anderson is, is our, our, our chief of HR and she'll be able to speak more to specific instances, but just some instances that we've, we've been investigating within the Commonwealth. You know, we've, we've, we've uh, employed issues management group to begin conversations with, with food banks. We, 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 we've begun conversations with, you know, female owned businesses who are operating within the Commonwealth for parts of our operation that could potentially be something along the lines of, you know, outbound communications to to customers and things of that nature. Uh, but again, I'm just going to throw it over to Amanda to, to, to flesh it out in other detail of what we've done in the past. 
Yes, thanks, Andrew. So as Laura mentioned in her presentation earlier, we are certainly exploring partnerships with women-owned businesses locally. They're specifically a call center operator, um, but would want to be actively involved in the community as well. So some examples of things that we've done locally in Denver would be a partnership with Project Angel Heart, um, which provides uh, meals for medically disabled persons. Um, we also participated even yesterday in the Martin Luther King Day Parade here locally in Denver. We've um, gathered food for our local food banks. We've done um, toy drives in our Denver office as well as our New York office. And like I said, would certainly look to extend that in any area that we are operating. What I, what I found interesting, Madam Chair, and, and to my fellow uh, commissioners is um, what you lacked in section C, at least in the application, thank you for elaborating what you've done. When you go to section D, I look at all the partnerships that you've created and all the dollars that you have given back um, in the diversity, equity, and inclusion section. So it's just kind of interesting where we were seeing those partnerships, but under the community engagement, I was hoping for a little bit more. But at the same time, I do want to give you kudos uh, for promoting your local uh, businesses, which I did see you partnered with a lot of them during certain events, the NCAAs, um, things of that sort. And something that I mentioned the other day, which is big for me, is working with our tourism industry uh, to ensure that this new industry uh, prevails so well here in Massachusetts. That would be my comments, Madam Chair, and thank you as always. Yeah, and Commissioner Hill, just to build on that, I'm, so, I'm glad that you saw that, um, uh, the points in the DEI, which we'll get to. I also noted um, what Mr. Moreno uh, mentioned on page 70, um, it may be that it, it's just, you know, our framing of the application. They did mention exactly what Ms. Anderson, Mr. Moreno just mentioned about their hope to be able to work on a community level with food banks, et cetera, here in Massachusetts. So the page 70 kind of supplements to uh, their answer. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, the other items in section C, which really did also as you said, give, you gave kudos to them for that. So, and supplemented orally today, so thank you. Commissioner Hill, we love that that's your, that you value that so much because we see this as a great opportunity for the Commonwealth. Agreed very much. Thank Madam you. Chair. Yes. Um, so I did see on page 62, um, a relationship with Troon and your willingness to engage with at least three golf courses in the Commonwealth. Um, so kind of to Commissioner Hill's point and the chairs, um, can you tell me a little bit about how this relationship works or will work in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, uh, uh, and thank you for the, the question, Commissioner. I, I want to throw it to Rick because I think, you know, our partnership with, with Troon really feeds into our overall marketing strategy. And he has a very good idea on how we would be deploying it uh, and how we have in the past. So uh, without further ado, I'll let Rick take it away. Yeah, happy to shed some light on that. Thank you for the question, Commissioner. Um, so our partnership with Troon is a really unique one, one that we're really proud of. It allows us to obviously tap into what is a premium partner in the world of golf, um, but also, again, through that localized marketing presence. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. The Troon Network uh, kind of expands to a lot of courses throughout the country, the three you mentioned in the state of Massachusetts. So we can tap into uh, VIP watch parties uh, or programs or tournaments that we do there. Uh, we can certainly uh, piggyback on any media that they're doing in that uh, environment. But the idea here is, you know, to reach a, a higher affluent customer, someone who's interested in sports, which translates also well to our product, where we feel we have one of the strongest golf betting um, product availabilities for uh, bettors there as well, including our most recent uh, update and visualizations powered by IMG data. Thank you. Mr. Maynard, are you gonna mention that you're a golf fan? So I, I would say to Rick, you know, I grew up um, uh, playing at municipal courses. And so I can tell you that even non-affluent people love golf and love to interact on a golf course. So I think you'll reach that, that market, but I think you're gonna reach a, 
uh, far broader market, at least in the Commonwealth. A lot of golfers. No doubt about it. Thank you for the follow-up. Okay. Follow up questions on or new questions on section C, Commissioner Bryan. Oh, um, Commissioner, I've got both of you. Uh, I'll defer Bryan. to Commissioner Skinner. Thank you. Commissioner Skinner. Commissioner, um, I had a question. Can we talk about the proposed call center? And maybe that's not a, a right term, proposed potential call center. Um, I didn't see a whole lot of detail in the application or in the presentation. And that may be because you don't have any in the beginning stages, but can you tell us if that's the case, what steps you've taken thus far um, to develop those plans? Yes, thank you very much for the question, Commissioner. Um, again, we are very much in the nascent stages of the discussion with, with this potential partner. Um, we're, we're now scoping what the work would look like and kind of continuing to have ongoing conversations with them about their capabilities and their availabilities. So it's, it's, it's very early in the process right now. And you know, for, for more details, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to go into it in an executive session. But I think from our point of view, again, we're interested in, in really sustained long-term partnerships and, and, and within, within, organ, within states that we work in. And, and so you know, we don't wanna rush anything. We wanna do our, our due diligence, but the, things, the talks have been very promising so far. And you do envision a brick and mortar location uh, and not, uh, you know, sort of a remote establishment based out of Massachusetts or rather utilizing Massachusetts residents uh, who work remotely. So in, ter in terms of our partnership with the call center, for example, is that what you're referring to? Yes. So our belief in, in our conversation so far is that they do have uh, brick and mortar locations uh, and do, they don't make use of remote work residencies or anything like that. So uh, again, we're still kind of going through the process of vetting all of their capabilities, but for now uh, it, it appears that that would be the case. Okay, so it's beyond, it's beyond just staffing. It's actually a, a, a formal partnership with the WBE operating here currently. Correct. That is, that is the potential, yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Skinner, would you like to explore that more if, if it's needed in executive session or you I would, I would actually, if that's appropriate. Ms. Moreno, I assume um, Councilor Grossman would ask you if you were to elaborate that that would put points about at a competitive disadvantage. So, yes, Commissioner. So Madam Chairwoman, yes, we would request that it be discussed in executive session if approved by the commission. Okay. Councilor Grossman, any questions at this time? You're gonna hold. I, I think I understand, thank you. Thank you, okay. Further questions on section C? Um, I had a couple of them, uh, Madam Chair. Um, in several areas in section C, you say that you're taking steps to engage, you know, a PR, a local PR firm, or taking steps to uh, exploratory discussions with certain communities. Um, and I'm wondering if you can be a little more specific than that. And if you can't be in the public forum, whether you could be more specific in connection with that in an executive session. Thanks for your question, Commissioner. Um, you know, we can be slightly more specific. I think within the executive session, I think that the, the one thing I want to stress, though, is that because these are such, uh, you know, early start of the, the conversations with a lot of these organizations, we, we can't really comment as to specific, you know, end goals and, and dates like that yet. I can tell you that we are very excited and, and anxious to do so. And I think, you know, this is just one step of the process when we, you know, have a reasonable idea that you know, maybe perhaps we'll be operating and then we can more do a lot of these partnerships. But uh, yeah, we, we would probably want to save that for an executive session discussion. Okay. Um, and then one of the things that I have to give you points for is um, your, you've said you already have English and Spanish ready to go on your platforms. I think you're the only one who's come in with Spanish, anything other than English ready to go. So I did wanna um, say that I was pleased to see that. 
Well, I appreciate you saying that. As a Spanish speaker myself, it would be uh, it would be shocking for me to not have enough option to uh, to use the app, but with the the right localization, right? Thank you, Madam Chair. Can we? Um, I apologize. I was taking notes on the last executive session. One, I missed the exact subject, Commissioner O'Brien. You were asking Mr. Marina about. So there, um, I asked him about. I believe there's a reference on page 62 where they talk about um, taking steps to engage PR, a local PR firm. And then I believe further down on that same page, it's um, having exploratory discussions about any direct relationships for local or regional community work. Um, and they indicated that because of the nature and the posture of those talks that they would feel more comfortable elaborating an executive session. Okay, thank you. Other questions on section C? I think I'll just mention uh, commissioners as a prompt. One of you want to mention the lottery has been addressed. Um, I think you're imagining cross marketing. Um, opportunities there and, and you acknowledge points back that you don't see the products competing if you want to just expand on that we'd welcome that please thanks yes thank you madam chair um we, we I'll, I'll defer to rick in a moment just just generally though we, we don't believe that our product offering and our platform are in any kind of direct competition with with lottery users i think rick you can speak a lot more to kind of our our target demographic and how that individual would probably supplement lottery play with their use of our product or not at all. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. I think they, they complement each other very well. So we're certainly more than happy to explore any potential partnerships with the lottery. We feel like our product lines up well as an adjacency to lottery users um, and that could help kind of both parties. So more than happy and open-minded on that front. Um, Excellent. Any other questions on section C? Can I take the commissioner's temperature on this section? I see you're still looking at your notes, so no hurry. Madam Chair, I'm satisfied that the applicant has met expectations for Section C. But I believe there was a um, question about a um, executive session question. So I don't know if we want to wait until after that before we. It would also include RSM's report. Commissioner Skinner, so sorry. Oh, RSM report for Section C. That's right. So yeah, I, I agree. I think we should. Uh, well, I don't know if this was your sentiment, Commissioner Hill, but I yep. think we should hold off on taking the temperature on this section until act after executive session. Agreed. Everyone's fine with that? And a couple of other issues. Great, thank you. All right, then moving on to DEI, section D. Madam Chair, yes. always interested in uh, hoping that one of your consumers can get to you 24 seven, which I read on page 74, they can, but can you explain to me, is that through chat? Is that through email? Can I get hold of a real person 24 seven? So if you can just kind of elaborate on that issue for me and I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, Commissioner. I'm going to refer to Bill Fox, who is our Director of Customer Service, to kind of go over. We have a number of different options, so I just, I just want to let him uh, address that right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, we do offer 24-7 customer service. Uh, we offer 
live chat, uh, email, and phone, all live person, so you can get to a live person 24-7. Um, I think a great example is when we launched in Ohio recently, uh, we launched at midnight on New Year's Eve. So, um, you know, we had lots of questions right at launch, and we were able to service all of our clients uh, through the holidays without interruption. Okay, that satisfies that question, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Skinner. Thank you. I'll speak to the diversity spend. Um, please that you've provided a number. Um, it's a big one, um, but truthfully means nothing without sort of a contextual number um, to, to uh, match that up against. And so if you could provide that at some point, hopefully you'll be willing. Um, but then also, I didn't see any goals mentioned in either the application or the presentation. So could you also speak to what those might be? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Skinner. Uh, I'll throw it now to uh, Amanda and Laura to, to speak on that specific item. Thank you, Andrew. Um, as I did mention in our presentation, PointsBet is committed to creating a diverse and inclusive workplace. Um, I am confident in saying stepping into this first quarter of the year, uh, we are focused on attracting and retaining diverse talent, um, increasing our diversity percentages year out over year, um, as well as setting up the creation of employee resource groups, introducing learning and development, such as unconscious bias into our workplace, um, and then to continue those partnerships uh, throughout the states that we operate and serve. Madam Chair. I'm no, I was probably, I bet Commissioner Skinner was going to ask, does that mean you have a goal? And can we see the goal? Thanks, Commissioner Maynard. Are you referring to a specific percentage number goal? Because I think a lot of our goals currently are programmatic and about building those programs that Laura was just referring to. Um, you know, we're happy to kind of, uh, as she said, continue our investment and, and try to beat year over year uh, our numbers every year uh, regarding diversity spend, diversity hiring, and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't know uh, that we can speak to a specific goal right now overall number, um, but if that's something that you want us to, to work on and get back to you, we're happy to submit something today. I, I mean, if possible, I'd like to see a goal. And if not possible, I'm going to weigh it against the, the application. So, and I retweet everything that Commissioner Skinner said earlier. <laughs> Appreciate that, Commissioner. Um, and yeah, we'll work on getting that goal number over to you immediately. I think that uh, to Commissioner Maynard's point, um, it's in the application, the request for a goal on supplier diversity. Perhaps there's some reverse engineering you can do uh, to, to supplement the application, correct, Commissioner Maynard, given that you did provide, as Commissioner Skinner points out, your spend, and um, that um, we haven't seen with all applicants. So now, and we hadn't seen with many applicants the um, the goal, but we have been asking for it. So, okay. yeah. Chair, I would correct one thing: it's the dollar amount of spend, not the total spend with the dollar amount of spend. Understood. And those. Spend goals, um, that, that is a question in the application that, that just wasn't answered uh, thoroughly. And so um, if, if you could provide that information, I'd like that. Commissioner Skinner, do you mind repeating? I just couldn't quite hear you. I'm sorry. I was just pointing out yeah. that the diversity spend goal, the oh, goals, excuse me, is uh, that's asked in the application in section D2. Happy to supplement our, our answers. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Skinner, I'm going to allow you to opportunity. You often concentrate a bit on the workforce numbers. Um, we have some yeah. real numbers in terms of leadership roles, but we don't necessarily have the percentages. Did you want to take the lead on that, Commissioner Skinner? I, I did do the percentages, Madam Chair. This yeah, is Commissioner. <laughs> I don't trust my math, but yes, Commissioner O'Brien, I'll take I'll take your lead. Yeah, so I did. I, I looked at them yesterday and, and I wanted to ask about that because the 
they're not great numbers compared to some of the other numbers that we've seen. So, and correct me if I'm wrong in the percentage calculations, but it would seem like um, you've only got 18.75% women uh, in the stats that was responsive to D1, C1. Um, and then in terms of the, the racial and ethnic diversity, it's about 73% white, is that correct? Uh, correct. I'll again have to refer to, to Amanda and Laura to, to, to flesh any of this out, but in terms of what's on our application, yes, correct. Yeah, so I'm wondering if you can speak to your efforts in both of those areas to get those numbers up. Sure. So we, we do have an ongoing partnership with Women in Sports Tech to actively recruit um, and women uh, into our workplace. We do recognize that we have room to grow in this space. Um, I am actually new to PointsBet, just started two weeks ago, and so this is top of my radar to, to have a strong focus in this area to re re attract and retain uh, women and diverse individuals into our workspace. Um, in terms of percentages, um, I will say the numbers that I was working off of come out to about 23% women in our workforce, 39% uh, make up our diverse workforce. And then if we dig deeper, it's about 26% women in leadership and 14% uh, diverse leaders. Okay, so I'm wondering if you can give me the raw numbers because the numbers I was working off of don't, those numbers are better than what I had. Um, what was presented today was I'm getting this some feedback, Commissioner Taylor. Feedback, Ken, yeah. Sorry, I don't know what that's about. Is that better? Yes, it is. Okay, I was just I was just pointing out to Commissioner O'Brien's point, the numbers we saw or percentages we saw in the presentation earlier today are different than what's reflected by the numbers in the application. So I, I don't know how how Ms. Leffler, excuse me, can explain that. Commissioner Skinner, yeah, this is right for VP of legal. My guess is there may have been um, differences as far as hiring from the time of application, but I think if Amanda's on, maybe she can speak to that more clearly. Yes, thank you, Rachel. Um, I was just gonna chime in there and say, yes, the numbers that we were looking at in preparation for this presentation were our current numbers. So that's maybe where the differences are coming from, from the application to today's presentation. Um, but I just wanna reiterate that it certainly is de &I and hiring and retaining diverse talent is certainly a focus of ours and as evidenced by the recent hiring of Laura into this role, specifically focusing in this space, we will continue to explore partnerships locally here, <laughs> excuse me, in Denver, as well as New York and in Rails that we have um, physical brick and mortar locations and we look to employ folks to be um, as diverse as possible. And then of course, like we will continue to look at our supplier diversity and our supplier spend as well to continue to um, award those contracts to diverse businesses as well. And I noticed in, when you stated your intentions to join various things, you've got um, obviously references to Sydney, the women in sports tech, um, and then some Colorado specific, you know, chambers of commerce, that sort of thing. So are you expanding that to New York? And then would you anticipate doing that in Massachusetts if you get even the call center or something like that up and running in Massachusetts? Yes, thank you for the question, Commissioner. We would certainly evaluate our opportunities to join those chambers there locally as well if we were to partner with a local owned um, call center or any other brick and mortar facility as we would want to be actively involved in that community. All right, thank you. Other questions on section D? I would point out that I did note um, uh, that with respect to, to your uh, commitment in Colorado, you are uh, reaching out to the Native American population and, and health issues there. And, and I think that I see Commissioner Maynard nodding your head. We, we appreciate that outreach. 
um, to Commissioner Skinner's earlier point, I think we're going to explore it more in executive session. We welcome the opportunity to have a brick and mortar here and to have you um, come and, and have an active presence here. And so in turn, we extend you know, our priorities and, and values, and that is around diversity in your workforce and workplace. We also know that your numbers may be a little bit lower. Um, I saw, I was looking at leaderships and I kind of had the same uh, percentages that you had, Ms. Anderson, as opposed to the overall number, which I didn't calculate out as well as Commissioner O'Brien. You're not the first applicant to, to indicate that there's some challenge here. But what I do like is that we've got plenty of women on this screen to really work on recruiting more and more women in technology and in the sports world uh, so that that diversity will be well represented. So, um, Mr. Moreno, the fact that you said you're Spanish speaking, your presence alone, right? Got that change faster than any other applicant in terms of having two languages. So um, that right there shows the value of making sure that we are um, diverse in our representation. So uh, thank you for thank you for the um, where you have indicated in your application your commitment to diversity in your other jurisdictions. Right. Other questions on section D, I think. I'm all set, commissioners. Do you, is anyone seeking supplemental information on this or any need for executive session? I may not have noted it. Are we all set? No need for an executive session, but I do think we have some, um, I'm sorry, we're still on D, right? So the goal, the goal of Supplier diversity. And you also asked for the um, overall spend. Yes. I don't know if they'll have that um, available in executive session. Should, is that something that would be readily avail available? Madam I Chairwoman, we can work to get those numbers for you as soon as possible. Um, and we can let you know if executive session is uh, feasible or not. If not, we will follow up with written communication as, as soon as the um, executive session is concluded. Okay. Madam Chair, I wasn't expecting that information in executive session, if that helps. Well, I wasn't sure if it would be protected or not, but if they actually can provide right. it today, even better. Right, Commissioner Skinner? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Other questions? Are we comfortable um, speaking on this, the quality of this section, commissioners? Has it met expectations? So, subject to getting additional information, I do believe it has met expectations. Thank you. I agree. I agree. Agreed. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Then we'll move on to responsible gaming and and an E. There's a compliance piece as well. Commissioners. I I have to say I very much like the presentation today on responsible gaming. Thank you. The application was very, very good too, but I thought the presentation was very thorough. So thank you. Commissioners. I just second that, Madam Chair. I think it was a very strong section. Any questions of Commissioner Skinner? Are you all set? Okay. Commissioner O'Brien. Um, I agree with that. I just I have a question on um you talk about sort of ad hoc putting icons out for information. I think it was page 72 of the application. Can you, I was wondering if you could give an example. Ad hoc um, responsible identification. Receive information about RG if they exhibit a red flag, 
you know, that sort of thing. So I'm just wondering, just a couple of examples that might trigger a red flag for that. Yeah, sure. thank you, Commissioner. I'll, I'll refer to Rachel Casper in just a moment. Uh, I just do, do want to say that uh, part of the ad hoc research and, 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 and sweeps that go on that the RG team does are cross-disciplinary. So our RG okay. team frequently deals with every other team. So they talk with trading, they talk with VIP managers, they talk with account managers, they, you know, they screen for, for, for chats and things like that. But it, it, it truly is a very uh, holistic approach. Uh, just for more detail, I'll turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, Andrew. That's exactly correct. And um, Commissioner O'Brien, I actually am joined here with our uh, Director of Customer Service. And I would just echo what Andrew said, which is it is cross-disciplinary and it's important that every single business unit within PointsBet is aware of our responsible gaming strategy and anyone who touches uh, patrons in the way of communication that they understand next steps. So that ad hoc initiative is really looking at sort of different triggers within the communication and then escalating through that comms plan that we have to our RG team. Um, I may turn it over to our director of customer service here to give some very generic examples of uh, maybe something or a communication style that would trigger something from a customer service side um, to escalate through RG. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, it's, it's really just being cognizant of, of what the client or the customers are saying. Mm -hmm. Um, looking for red flags, um, a situation where a, a customer might say, I'm not going to be able to pay rent if you don't cancel my bet, or, you know, you can go as, as far as even more alarming flags. But those are immediate reviews that we flag to the RSG team to take a look at the account um, because it's the it's at the foremost uh, importance for us. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I think so obviously we pointed out one of the flags being overt communication of concern around finances. And that one's obviously easy to identify. But as Andrew said, we do have other business units who kind of look at a compilation of factors, right? So the number of deposits versus, you know, um, the alignment of the profession that they have, right? And sort of what they are sort of in their community. So there are some pretty robust behavioral um, explorations that we do on each patron based on different signs that we're seeing. Um, but some of those red flags, again, spend, direct communication. Um, we talked about chasing losses, right? So if they've placed a wager and they've lost it and they keep placing another one, right, that's obviously not good behavior. And so these are things that would be those red flags um, that would then escalate to our responsible gaming team. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Brown, I'm going to follow up on something that you raised with respect to an earlier applicant. As I mentioned, I thought that the um, application and the presentation was really strong on the responsible game, gaming um, policy and approach. I couldn't tell from your application whether this is a plan that's been adopted um, by you know, your, your board um, or our governance committee, whatever procedures are in place. Um, then, if so, if there's a, a, a way for you to, to communicate that to us. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, before I give you an affirmative in public session, I will confirm that internally um, and communicate in writing whether or not has been approved at the board level. Unless, Andrew, you know differently. Well, no, I, I was just going to add on to that, Rachel, um, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, regardless of whether or not there's board approval, we can say that our internal controls go through approvals for each jurisdiction that we go into. And we have formal adopted RSG policies in each state's internal controls that conform to the requirements and in many cases exceed them. So that's that's what I would say is actually probably more of a gold-plated uh, sign of approval is that in each of the jurisdictions we go into, we get formal approval from those regulators. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes, Commissioner. So I don't know if we want to get into this discussion now or a little later, but starting on page 81, um, some of the issues that rose. To, let me just bring up the page. Are you looking at the um, E3, the compliance issue? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, before we turn to that, can I just mention it again um, when I asked about the the icon with the little eye? I thought uh, I think we should think about that, commissioners, because it notes that in 2020, Massachusetts players scored low to medium on gambling literacy, and I'm sure that Director Vanderlyn is aware of that. So um, I like. I like that there's an electronic, you know, tab where they're pointing out what that means um, and continues to educate on gambling literacy. So I just wanted to give kudos to you on that and then just put it in our parking place for us to consider. Again, remind me, Commissioner Hill, the page where it starts. Page 81. Yep, got it. Anything else before we turn to this, Commissioners? On responsible gaming. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Hill, some of this might be protected, and and uh, <clears throat> should we ask Councillor Grossman to help us navigate this, or did you have a specific question? How do you want to approach it? So I think I would first ask, uh, what can they tell us in public, and what they're comfortable with, and you know, I'm always hesitant to bring up what I'm concerned about in case it's a an executive session issue, but I do see where there has been, you know, a final disposition on a couple of these. So I'll, I'll put it out there and tell me, Todd, if I'm not allowed to say it or not, but I see a lot, uh, a theme of unauthorized events and prohibited, event, um, prohibited events cause some angst for you. And I was wondering if you could talk about those issues publicly or not. Thank you, Commissioner Hill, for the question. I think I can answer it very broadly in the public portion and then based on sort of just uh, competitive sensitivity would request that we address specifics um, in executive session. Um, but generally, just like any other operator in this space, um, we obviously integrate with different data feed providers. And as our sort of manager of trading compliance was highlighting earlier, um, we put those blockers in place um, I think I can't understate the level uh, and complexity of data coming in and out of different systems. And so sometimes even at the best with every blocker in place, there are certain things the way that they're coded into the system or the data is flowing through or there is a lag. So there is the amount of data coming in that if there is a sort of millisecond lag, right, that something doesn't get captured in time and goes on site for 10 minutes, right, that that may occur. Um, and again, that's not unique to points, but that's something that every single operator would experience in every jurisdiction. I think the key and what is important to take away here um, is the level of manual oversight that our trading teams have globally um, over the uh, authorized trading markets and the different processes and procedures that we have in place to capture it as soon as possible and, and to remove it. I would also bolster it with saying that whenever this occurs, the first uh, and foremost uh, thing of importance is communication trans transparency um, with any regulator to make sure that if there is an impacted patron that it's handled uh, pursuant to the regulations and um, our house rules and terms and conditions. But I think broadly, that's that's what I would say about a potentially a prohibited market going on site. And I will pause and pass it back over either to Andrew Moreno or Andrew Menino to see if they have any additional comments. Thanks, Rachel. I'll be for me. Commissioner Hill, do you want to learn more in executive session on that? I think I would, Madam Chair, because um, didn't it, there was a frequency to this particular issue that I'm concerned with. So I think if we can talk about an executive session, you although I, I'm, I'm looking at the cases and they look like, again, they've been disposed of. So again, I don't know if those are public or not. Yeah, I think uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, if I can jump in, it might be helpful. Uh, and thank you, uh, Ms. Casper for that overview. Uh, but to the extent that Commissioner Hill, you or any of the other commissioners are interested in understanding the particulars of any of these instances, we should go through those specific situations. It's my general understanding. And now that we've been through this a number of times, uh, we've confirmed that 
that most of these look like uh, matters of public record. Uh, certainly any defenses raised or uh, specifics as to um, adjustments uh, or remedial action that was taken by the company uh, based upon these would not necessarily be public, but uh, the facts of these matters and the resolution are likely uh, public information. So if there are specific instances here that you'd like to talk more about, we should ask that they describe those uh, for you, see if that answers your questions. And if not, we could go into executive session to, to talk about some of the real particulars. And they're listed, I think it's fair to identify them by state. They're all, they begin on, uh, as you noted, uh, Commissioner Hill, on page 81 of the application. I believe they're the same um, uh, events that are described in the IEB's report as well. Um, so if, if you wanna go through them, you know, just identifying them by state and then the page they're on, I think we could ask uh, Ms. Casper and her team to try to identify them in as much detail as possible. So if I could just say the first three, Indiana starting on page 81. Thank Can you, I'd be Commissioner. Satisfied with that. You would like us to pro provide just more context around what occurred there? Is that their yes, question? Yes, please. Yep. yep. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Andrew Menino. Um, so, the, the first one out of Indiana it looks like it was uh, an August 4th um, for the English League Football One Third Tier League um, that went on site. Andrew, can you speak to sort of uh, some specifics around how that happened? Yep. Uh, so uh, this is an example, you know, with these incidents, uh, we've seen a variety of, of causes here. And this one in particular is a manual error uh, where a trader was working to get this market up in one jurisdiction and inadvertently uh, loaded it to other jurisdictions. Um, and what we've done this year is work to expand our notification system for our trading team. Uh, so we've built a, a, a blacklist that contains every league, which is uh, unapproved in each jurisdiction and is sweeping all our websites every one minute uh, to respond and notify traders. So there's no longer any, any amount of time longer than one minute that uh, markets can stay on site like that um, without being notified to traders and, so, uh, for instance, in this case, if we go up with um, English uh, League One today in Indiana, the, the blacklist would immediately uh, catch that and notify traders. And so what we've tried to do, as we've seen these various incidents come from uh, a combination of manual and feed issues, is try to create a system whereby we can catch as many of these errors as quickly as possible when they do occur. We work as hard as we can to stop them from going on site. And in those cases where they do go on site, uh, we want to make sure that we're able to detect them and respond to them as quickly as possible. Thank you, Andrew. I think the second one, Commissioner Hill um, for Indiana, was a data feed issue specifically around a collegiate bowl and East West Shrine Bowl. I'd like to point out here this challenge, again, is not unique to points, but in the sense that when there are approved leagues or markets, there are often offshoots, bowl games, et cetera, that may not be sanctioned by a league. And sometimes it's not um, completely evident to operators or data feed providers. And I think that is what occurred here. But again, we'll let Andrew provide some more context. Yep. So this is an example where the feed uh, created a, an automated challenge for us. So in... Our feed system, we have particular blockers on college sports, which prevent prohibited teams from uh, appearing on site. In this case, the feed provider included uh, collegiate all-star games, uh, including the Collegiate Bowl and the East-West Shrine Bowl under the umbrella of their NCAA. Uh, and so these games automatically appeared on site. Uh, this happened um, during the overnight uh, in the U.S. time and uh, was immediately noticed in the morning and taken down by US traders. Uh, this is another good example of the sort of thing where we work to improve and our blacklist now would catch this uh, much faster 
rather than uh, the number of hours that these were on site uh, when this uh, incident occurred around this time last year. Uh, we've also worked closer with our feed providers uh, to look for these unusual markets and speak to them constantly, be in regular communication uh, for anything out of the normal or outside of regular season events. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and Commissioner Hill, on the, the third one in that particular list, um, also out of uh, Indiana, had to do with a uh, listing of an Olympic event on site where wagers were taken. What I would say here too, again, and I think as this industry evolves, you know, we're all getting better and better as the days go on. I think um, obviously the approved events being marked both and blocked on the, the feed provider side as well as the operator side. Um, but also the unique thing about sports and sports wagering is the different um, offerings every time of year, right? And something like the Olympics every four years, right? Um, versus the NFL season that occurs um, periodically every fall. Um, and so I would say here, you know, Andrew will expound upon how this, this occurred, um, but we continue to work and strengthen those partnerships um, and, you know, expedite the process within our own tech to catch these things um, at, at the speed of light. Yeah, so this is another example of a, of a manual error where a uh, market was uploaded to one jurisdiction and incorrectly uploaded to others. Uh, this is the sort of thing where with the Olympics, what we found was um, a significant difference in regulations across various states and what was approved. Uh, so what we ended up doing, and we learned from this, this happened on the first day of uh, the Olympics in 2021. And what we did was, well, what we were able to learn from this was how to prepare uh, for future Olympic events. We used uh, this experience from the Summer Olympics and applied it to the Oli Winter Olympics. And what we're able to do is get a full list of all competitors who are under 18 at the time of the Olympics and include that in our uh, sweeping services uh, for those future Olympics. Um, so again, a good example of uh, not the initial outcome we were looking for, but an opportunity for us to learn tighten up our, our pro programs and policies and work towards ensuring uh, less uh, unapproved competitors in the future, especially in things like the Olympics where we see underage athletes. I wanna thank you uh, for the, that explanation and for those last um, three issues. Madam Chair, I'm satisfied with what I've heard and I don't need to go into an executive session to hear anything further. Um, in this regard. So thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Other questions on this table or any follow-up to discussion we just heard? Okay. It's also in Indiana. Uh, the second one down from the last incident we just discussed is on page. Commissioner Skinner, I'm just having a little trouble hearing you. I'm so sorry. But 80, what page? Page 83. Okay, yep, I'm there. And the first one on the list. Huh. The first full entry, Indiana. Okay, well, I'm Indiana. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner for is this for the August 4th uh, event? I don't have the benefit of page numbers. I apologize. September 30th. Got it. March 23rd. March 23rd. September 30th, 2020. Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Skinner. Uh, so this was... Yes. Oh, so uh, just to give a little bit of, of context here, and um, again, if executive session is, is needed further, we'll let you know. Obviously, every jurisdiction has um, a list of individuals that they prohibit as sports wagering participants, um, often coaches, athletes, etc. cetera. Um, and so that was the situation here. And through uh, due diligence and sort of monitoring an individual um, we believed them to actually be a prohibited participant um, of a team. 
and we took immediate action to reach out to the regulator. Um, again, each participant when they sign up says that they are not a prohibited person um, and unless we're provided with the names of those individuals by a league or association, we have no proactive way of, of blocking them, but we have a team that manually searches through monitors, behavior, names, et cetera. And so when they find them, we report that um, to, to the regulated authority um, as, as we did here. And I will pause for a minute and, and let um, Andrew Menino add anything additional. Nothing in it on my end on this. Well, thank you. I'm satisfied with that. No need to go into executive session. Um, you know, while, while I think it is a serious issue, I'm happy to learn that is it is um, perhaps not as serious as I suspected because I thought it involved an individual on the um, self-exclusion list. So um, thank you. Helpful clarification. Thank you. Okay, further questions on this section cross-referenced in the IEB report, of course. Commissioner Skinner, I would just like to follow up. I'm going to confirm for you that was not the case after you um, sort of highlighted that I will actually confirm that it was not a self-excluded person um, through prohibition. Um, there, just want to make sure I'm not mixing up my facts, and so I will uh, follow up in writing on that. And only one of the four actually placed wages, but placed a number of them. But it looks as though this was all reported by twice back to the regulator. Correct. Right. Okay, you have the chance to scroll through, commissioners. Any? Any further questions on these items? They conclude on page 85. Is that commissioners? Commissioner O'Brien, are you all set? Okay, excellent. Well, and I, um, I thank the commissioners for going through that. I led with a question about what you had indicated were redundancies to mitigate um, uh, those um, offerings of prohibited events. So I thank Commissioner Hill for your follow up. It's a important, very important issue. And uh, thank you for the redundancies that you've put in place. So then we would move on. Well, let's see, commissioners, how do we feel about section E? 
I believe the applicant has met expectations, Madam Chair. As do I. Same. I'm good. Okay, excellent. And just if we would hear about any kind of a formal adoption of the, the plan, uh, but I am hearing you is that it's been part of the submissions of the internal controls. So thank you. Um, I'm all set. Let's see, then turning to F. I guess I would point out that you, um, you have highlighted how independent you are in terms of, um, of having your proprietary stack. Um, I appreciate that with respect to both KYC and geolocation you're using well, and, and um, monitoring, you're using well-known third-party uh, vendors, GeoComply, um, ID, yeah, ideology, did we say it that way? Ideology and then um, US integrity. Thank you for that. Other observations or questions regarding section F? Any questions, commissioners? I'm actually, I'm actually ready to say that the applicant has met expectations for section F. We've gotten pretty good at this. We have. Um, this section, we're very familiar now with um, the process. So thank you. And, and you're, I think the application was extremely clear and thorough. So um, it's not a lack of interest that they're not asking questions, that's for sure. Commissioner Maynard, were you leaning in? I agree with Commissioner Hill. And I also agree with you that, you know, this has been a robust answer set. We've seen more and more of them and it's not a lack of interest. It's, uh, it's a familiarization with, with what you're putting in your application. Excellent, thank you, Commissioner Maynard. Commissioner Skinner. I think this section meets expectations. Excellent. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Same. Okay. We're all set then to move on to G. Well, I know that we are waiting for the RSM presentation in the executive session that will address the financial security piece. We just went through a lot of the suitability issues and that were raised um, in terms of Compliance. Are there other questions, commissioners? Is this we've moved on to G? Yeah. 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 Um, so the uh, mine is more a question of um, there was a list of all the other jurisdictions. And one of them uh, expired in December. And it's probably just a creature of how those are being distributed. But um, I think the New Jersey, can someone address sort of how that works, the December New Jersey expiration? This is yes, thank you. Gaming license, correct? Yeah. Yeah, Ra Rachel, I, I'm sure you can handle that easily. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, Commissioner O'Brien. So um, obviously each state is different. Most of the states have a sort of renewal application regulation. So you have to submit your renewal within, you know, 120, 90 days, whatever it may be, 180. And they normally have a provision within the regulation that says the expired license will basically remain active until the commission has rendered a final decision on the application. New Jersey is slightly different. Um, so we are still actually um, pending for a CSIE license there. What New Jersey does is they actually approve what's called a transactional waiver through the attorney general's office. And we normally submit that in combination with our market access partners um, and the um, New Jersey Division of Gaming Enforcement authorize that transactional waiver um, at the end of this year and is effective. And I'm, we're more than happy to pass that along as proof of ongoing licensure in that state. 
I should say authorization to operate, not licensure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. If you could forward that, just sure. so that the clear, because it it you said no, but then it looked like it lapsed, so that explains it. Thank More you. than happy to. Questions on section G. Commissioner Skinner. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can. I, can. Okay. I saw a reference to a withdrawal uh, of an application out of Ohio. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, thank you for your, thank you for your question, Commissioner Skinner. Um, we had been pursuing a possible uh, partnership with a retail location during the licensing proce process there. Um, however, given the um, just availability of licenses and where the process was going towards uh, on, that, on that track and where we were with our mobile sports wagering license, we wanted to focus on the mobile sports wagering license. We didn't feel that there was a real realistic possibility that the partner we had been speaking to and having these exploratory discussions with was going to be able to get their license from the OCCC, just as a main, just as a matter of the fact that they were a limited number of licenses, they wouldn't have been, you know, one of the preferred candidates. And so we just felt it more prudent to withdraw from the process rather than drag it out and waste the OCCC's time. Thank you. Other questions on G? And there's confirmation that you have received your licenses in Maryland and Ohio. How's it going? Going very well. Thank you for asking, Madam Chair. <laughs> in both states, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, we've been all kind of working at the same time. So congratulations to you for entry there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, everyone's examining their notes. Okay, whoops. All right, commissioners, I know that we have to go into executive session on the financial piece. Barring that, is there any other supplemental information? Oh, you just asked for clarification on, on um, New Jersey, Commissioner O'Brien. So we'll get that clarified. But otherwise, no other supplemental information that you need at this time. I'm hoping, um, Ms. Casper, that these items are, are not so complex. I know you're at the end of our, our um, review. If something takes longer, we will absolutely figure out a way to accommodate you, but to the extent that you can be responsive sooner than later on these matters, that would be really helpful to us. Putting a little yes, bit of mm -hmm. yes we're, we're more than happy to, and I've, I've already uh, forwarded along our transactional waiver, so it should be forthcoming here shortly. Appreciate that very much. Um, anything else then on G? I think we satisfied everything, um, all the items raised in this, the um, suitability report with Commissioner Hill's questions. You didn't have a need for an executive session. Okay. So commissioners, if there are no uh, additional questions with respect to G, do you think it meets expectations subject to the RSM report? Commissioner O'Brien? Uh, yeah, I think it's LGA though this time around. Oh, I'm so sorry. My apologies. Yes, yeah. thank you. That's correct. And then. Agreed. Thank you. Commissioner Skinner? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Maynard? 
Oh yeah, my last notes, I agree. Thank, I'll set that, okay, thank you. Um, and I agree as well. So I will just turn now to Councilor Grossman. So what do we have for executive session items we need to address? We have uh, three items uh, that I have on my list here for uh, potential executive session discussion. The first is a request that the um, applicant and LGA uh, provide specific information relative to financial projections, trends, and associated methodologies, including those related to revenue projections, to market share projections and percentages, uh, to handle and hold percentages, and to any other information associated with any of those issues and that are otherwise related to the applicant's financial stability and security. That's the, the first issue. Secondly, um, there was a question based on section C5A, uh, whereby the applicant will be asked to detail uh, its perspective uh, steps to engage with uh, local, a local public relations firm um, and any other local or regional community uh, engagement work opportunities. Uh, so that is the second uh, issue. And the third one, and Commissioner Skinner, this is one you'd asked about. I thought I had it, but I just want to make sure I got it right. Um, there was a question uh, whereby the applicant was going to be asked to provide further details as to prospective partnership um, or arrangement with the local uh, women's business enterprise. And I thought it was related to their call center partnership, but I'm not sure I had that. Is that right? Okay. So that was that was the third issue. And I didn't have anything else on the list. I do have some areas of uh, supplement, but those are separate. Do you want to go just through that too, please, or do you want to hold on that? We'll hold on that in, um, for public. Commissioners, are we all set with respect to that list on executive session? Okay. So, um, to the extent that we decide um, to move in this direction, I do need to read this into the record, as you know. This is all with respect to competitive disadvantage, correct, Councillor Grossman? Yes, and thank you, Madam Chair. Before you go, it's, it's sometimes helpful if I just note that based upon uh, my review of all these matters, as you just indicated, they do all implicate competitively sensitive information which has been provided in the course of this application and the disclosure of which would place the applicant at a competitive disadvantage, which would make use of section 6i as you were just inquiring about appropriate uh, in this, these circumstances. Okay, excellent. So with that, the commission anticipates that it may meet an executive session in conjunction with its review of PointsBet Massachusetts LLC's application in accordance with GL chapter 30A, section 21A, subsection seven and GL Chapter 23 and Section 6, um, Subsection I, to consider information submitted by the applicant in the course of its application for an operator license that is a trade secret, competitively sensitive, or proprietary, and which, if disclosed publicly, would place the applicant at a competitive disadvantage. I have a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we go into executive session for the to talk about the reasons to talk about the matters delineated by General Counsel Grossman and for the reasons enunciated by the chair. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Hill. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Any questions or edits? Okay. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. Commissioner Maynard. Aye. And I vote yes. And um, this would allow us to go into executive session. We do anticipate returning to our public um, meeting at the conclusion of the executive session. I think we all recognize that probably lunch is a good idea. It's 11.30, uh, 1.30, um, uh, 1.30 and suggest we come back at, at Two and then we would move into executive session. Is that how we should do it? 
Or should we move into our executive session room now, Crystal? Which way have we been doing? You have been moving into the room and then um, having your lunch. Okay. So uh, for the public, we're gonna we're going to have a lunch of half an hour, and then we're going to have our executive session, and then we'll reconvene in the public. But at this point, um, to all of our guests, the applicant, uh, Crystal will will um, ask you to join the executive session room. Thank you.
Okay, Dave, I think we're all set. Commissioners, we're reconvening today's meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission number 424. And because we're holding this meeting virtually, I'll take a roll call, Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. Commissioner Hill. I'm here. Uh, Commissioner Skinner. I'm here. And Commissioner Mayer. I'm here. All right. And uh, for the public, we just uh, uh, had a, a brief lunch and then had our executive session. So we're returning to uh, the completion of item number four on our agenda. Um, there, as we were going through the you know, section by section analysis, we deferred. Uh, our assessment on section C. So commissioners, um, we were had the benefit of the financial analysis that needed to be done in the executive session. And we had a couple of other questions answered. Are we, do we feel that the applicant has met expectations now with respect to section C? Commissioner Skinner. Madam Chair, I feel the section has met expectations. Excellent, thank you. Agreed. Thank you, Commissioner Hill. Agreed. Same. Great, thank you, and I'm all set as well. So that takes care of our review of the, um, the um, application. Uh, I don't know if um, this makes, makes sense, Councilor Grossman, for you to just go through the items that uh, I know that we've already received at least one um, response, so I'll have you go through that list just to make sure that the commissioners are all set. This is um, the last of the six applicants, and, and um, we'll get to our thank you, but we express our gratitude to you for a, a fine application uh, and a very, very nice presentation today. Commissioner, Councilor Grossman. Thank you. So the, the first item on my list was that the applicant was asked to establish workforce and uh, supplier diversity goals. Um, and as it applies to the supplier side that and include the overall spend uh, plans. So that's the, the first issue. The second was that uh, Ms. Casper was going to confirm uh, that the Indiana matter from September of 2020 did not involve any excluded individuals. Uh, yes, and Councilor Grossman, I can actually confirm that that was inaccurate. I did send a follow-up email. We did look at the settlement and order and it was uh, self-excluded individuals. And my apologies to the commission um, for that misstatement. No intent to mislead. Thank you, Ms. Casper. Do you have any follow-up questions, uh, Commissioner Skinner, on that now that there's been some clarification? I do. I'm, I'm just hoping you could walk us through how that was. <clears throat> First off, my specific question is, you know, was this a single day or um, did it happen over multiple days? Um, I, I think the uh, number of times the individual, at least the one individual, was committed to wager um, is astounding. Uh, so hoping you could shed some light on what happened there and the steps you've taken to um, remediate any issues. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Skinner, for that. I appreciate it. Um, I think it's worth highlighting for the, the commission the different processes around self-exclusion state by state. A lot of it is also dependent on, one, the regulations that each board agency or commission issues, as well as their ability to automate from their side. So. Um, the ingestion of self-excluded data sometimes is manual and sometimes it's automated. Um, as you can imagine, any type of manual transmission and upload, there are opportunities for error, uh, which you'll likely see in events like this. Um, I was not present here at points, but when this occurred, so per Commissioner Skinner, I would have to actually go back and sort of look through details to give you an exact of how, th how this happened. Um, but what I can say is that the length of time that somebody would be allowed to be on platform is likely a result of a non-match rate. Right? And so what, what that means is that there was a, potentially an entry in the last name or a misentry in the DOB where it wasn't caught, something along those lines um, in the back end of the system. 
again, it's never intentional and, it, and we sweep uh, and we have obviously implemented different processes uh, over the life cycle of PointsBet to ensure that we're actually uh, monitoring the list that we receive from regulators, that they're ingested timely, um, that there are no errors. So we've, we've come a long way and we have a cross-functional team between our data engineers um, and our sort of, uh, you know, folks that deal with all of the um, AI and reporting functionality, as well as the uh, compliance teams. And I'm more than happy to give a full brief uh, in writing on the sort of events of that situation, Commissioner Skinner, but I'm not personally knowledgeable about what, what happened on that particular day. And this, I'm sorry, this occurred and I'm just trying to get back to that page. Um, the, the incident was September, 2020, I believe, right? That is it's correct. Not, it's not currently a pending item. It, it, there was a, a, a disposition of it by Indiana, correct? That is correct. There was a final order uh, issued by the commission and I believe it was on March 23rd, 2021. Okay, I'd love to get the full written uh, sure. summary of what occurred and um, the steps. I, are you prepared to discuss the steps you've taken to remediate it? With I don't think so, right? Because you don't you don't have a full summary yet of what. Yeah, I don't know occurred. exactly what happened, Commissioner Skinner. So I'll have to look into that. What I can tell you is we've obviously come a long way from March 2021 to where we are today in 2023. Um, and again, each, each state is different as far as their self-exclusion process. So we'll have to dig into the details there, um, but we're more than happy to, to share that with you all. Thank yeah, you. Just to add to what Rachel said there, Commissioner Skinner, I, I can't speak to the, the specific steps, but I can speak to the investment in, in compliance that has gone on over time here at PointsBet. And it's been significant. And just to see the kind of processes being put into place and the kind of attention to detail and just the staffing from the staffing level, uh, everything's gotten, you know, uh, leveled up to a certain degree. Uh, and so I'd say generally speaking, we can at least point to that and say, you know, these kinds of problems are a lot harder for them to happen now, just given the number of eyes that are on every issue. I may clarify, uh, Ms. Casper, it also may be helpful just to uh, send over a copy of the settlement agreement, which may or may not detail some of this. Yep, more than Thank happy you. to send that as well as the final order from the commission. Thank you. Am I correct that there is no benefit to an executive session on this matter, Ms. Casper? You wouldn't be able to offer any additional information in any case, correct? No, and the public facing documents from the IGC will not um, delineate any personal information of the individuals. It's pretty high level, nothing more than what we've discussed here today. So, Madam Chair, before we move on, I'm sorry, I was going back through my notes and one of the areas I did want to talk about and I forgot to was whether I, I believe PointsBet may have had some associations with colleges or universities in terms of advertising and marketing. Um, it was not in the four corners of what was given to us, but um, can somebody from PointsBet tell me whether I'm confusing you with someone else or whether you do in fact have those relationships? Yes, Commissioner O'Brien, we, we do have relationships with, with two colleges and, and um, you know, I'd, I'd like Rick to talk probably a little bit more about kind of the substance of those partnerships. Uh, I, I will say though that you know, we, we take our responsibilities and obligations in these agreements and partnerships incredibly seriously. Um, you know, there's a heavy RSG component in both and in all, in all of the things that we do. So I just want to, you know, make, make that point known and, and then turn it over to Rick to kind of discuss a little bit more uh, what, what those partnerships look like and, and the purposes of them. Yep, absolutely. You can happily join in here. Um, so that would be with the University of Colorado and University of Maryland. Uh, Colorado being the much more substantive one, being our home bases in Colorado, and predominantly a lot of the components of that are around actually um, recruitment and helping the university expand their actual programs around sports, sports technology. Um, that includes speaking on campus, uh, donations to the business school. Um, and uh, you'll see in stadium, a lot of the signage that would promote points bet wouldn't have a typical call in or, or download now button, it would be much more about celebrating bringing technology jobs to the state of Colorado. Um, and so beyond that, 
we're very conscious that any kind of marketing materials through a university 